have them email me or give me a call and, and I'll meet with them one on one. We are going to do one regional roundtable at the end of this. I think this is the 32nd. Is this the 32nd? Yes, of this type, yes, 30 seconds. We've done 32 of these around Southwest Virginia and gathered all this information from each county, and the regional roundtable will disperse all this information that, that we've collected. And I encourage you guys to regis register for that. The date on it has changed. It'll be June the 20th now. And everybody that comes to that, that have attended these business roundtables, uh, we have your emails, and you guys are going to get emails announcing that again too. And there'll be an event, uh, Eventbrite registry. So just make sure you register and and attend that. Okay. And I'm going to turn you guys over to Sam. And thank you for coming. Morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here again. Um, I think many of you uh, have participated in uh, some of these uh, roundtable events in the past. Uh, if you have, you'll know that there's something I go through every time at the beginning, uh, and uh, I'm not going to fail today. I didn't start doing it until uh, part of the way in, but there's a very specific reason why I do it. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to go around the table, everybody, have everybody introduce themselves, and I want you to tell me one positive thing that's happened to you today. One really good thing that's happened to you today. Okay, Jason, you want to start with that? Uh, sure. Positive. Did you yes. say three positive things? Yes, three positive things. <laughs> three? One is fine. Okay. Three, three would be great things. if you have three. I'm, I'm uh, sorry, my, my mind was we'll somewhere else. Uh, okay, I've actually been organizing an open house job fair for Wise County at the Wise County Career and Technical Center. And I got confirmation this morning that, that actually three businesses that I was trying to get there are going to be in attendance. And as of right now, I have well over 50 businesses and partnering agencies that are going to attend this job fair. So I, I encourage you guys to come out and check it out. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Ernie McFadden, Russell County IDA, and I guess my good thing for today is uh, one of our prospects that we've been working on. I got some very encouraging news today that looks like that is moving forward. So hopefully we'll have another announcement soon in the future. So. Okay. And I'm Sharon Van Dyke. I work uh, for as a county executive for um, Preferred Home Health, but I'm also the president of the Russell County Chamber of Commerce. Been long time involved in uh, the Chamber of Commerce here in Russell County. So a positive thing this morning was um, I called my daughter, and of course I hear in the background my grandson who said, "Hi, Grammy. I love you big." <laughs> very positive. Very positive. Can't be better. Uh, Sharon Owens, I'm at the Russell County Career and Technology Center, um, here representing the school systems. My positive today was I had a student who had an issue yesterday, and so we came in this morning and I composed an email and walked him through how to try to compose an email correctly and um, keep things short and simple and to the point without a lot of excuses. And uh, so he just he did a real good job and. It was, it was enjoyable to see a kid grow. So. Great. I'm Kevin Lundpower. I'm the new senior project manager for uh, Manufacturing Technology Center in TC at Wickham Community College. Um, so my positive for today, I was on the phone with Nelson T, the executive director of MTC this morning. So we did some general dynamics yesterday in Marion and um, trying to help them grow, get more business in the DOD sector. And they're uh, firm enough. They want some technical training to help uh, them grow their business. So. So it looks like the, the meeting we had yesterday was very good. So uh, we want to help GD grow going forward. Um, I'm Lou Wallace. I'm a elected Russell County Board of Supervisor for District 2. That would be North Castlewood, St. Paul, and a portion, uh, a portion of St. Paul and Dane. And um, actually this morning I got a confirmed email from a volunteer that uh, said that they would be helping set up at a booth and I know that sounds very trivial, but the part of this is it's showcasing their community. And volunteers are real hard to come by. And training volunteers to rise up in their communities are crucial in this day and time because their communities are lost almost. And so this has been a really good sign for me because a lot of people are scared to stand at a booth and talk, their, tell their story. So this has all been good. All right. Thank you. 
Yeah, my name is Ernie Bank. I'm with ARC Television, and uh, I got confirmation today that we've got a group that's working on the history of Central Appalachia Mountains and where our original forts, forts were. Like, as far as I know, nobody knows exactly where Moore's Fort was, but Daniel Boone was in charge of that. So there's so much history to tell in this area, and we need to tell it and put it on YouTube and go worldwide with it. My name is Tommy Asher, uh, I'm a community builder at UVA WISE, and uh, I'm down to one final until graduation, so I'm pretty happy about that. That's, that's yeah. a pretty positive. That's a positive. Yeah. Yeah. Steven. Steven Mullins, Small Business Coordinator with the Southwest Virginia Workforce Development Board. Today is the first time that we've had a round table in the Russell County Government Center, and the board staff no longer resides in the Russell County Government Center. We've moved to a new location down on uh, Flanagan Avenue, which is, uh, as you're going toward the hospital, you make that turn and it turns into that other road named after the other doctor. Uh, but we, the uh, McFarland Hillman Pharmacy, we're in the second floor of that. And the, well, the good news is not I don't care where we are, but the fact is that this is the first event where I've had to actually come back to this building as a visitor instead of somebody who resides here. So it's positive because we love the new offices. We had them remodeled according to our dictates and what we wanted, and we all have windows now. <laughs> we never had windows before. If you wanted to know what it was doing outside, you had to go walk outside. But now you can just look out. And it's just, I mean, it's just more pleasant. And of course, there is still a lot of junk in my office that I need to either throw away or do something with. But I'm about 85% done with that task. So there's real good news there. And I'm Sam Wolpert. Uh, I'm with Gen Edge, we're a manufacturing extension partner for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, we partner with the Manufacturing Technology Center uh, out of the Full Community College uh, to provide services to a lot of different groups uh, across the Commonwealth. Um, you're probably wondering why in the world is someone who works with manufacturers here talking about regional growth. And let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, we started this process just meeting with manufacturers. And as we started talking with the manufacturers, we started going through where that, they're at, where some of their challenges are, what they're dealing with, we realized their problems, their challenges, what they face day to day is no different than the entirety of the community. So we said, okay, well, let's open this up to communities. And we've had really good participation overall. Um, like uh, Jason said, we've done 33 of these, um, this particular type. Uh, this is the last one before we do the big event. Now I'll give you a little bit of information about the big event. Uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be coming together here uh, in this facility. Uh, we felt like this was fairly central to the entirety of the region that we're covering with this particular type of, of business roundtable. And we're going to talk about all the things that we have in common across the region. Uh, all of the strengths and the opportunities, all the problems and the threats. We're going to talk about the structure of our communities and what all the services are that our, com our communities utilize, um, need, uh, the businesses and industries that are there. We're going to talk about um, you know, where we are as far as their markets go. You know, what is the context that we are operating in today? And we're going to do that very quickly, in a very, very short period of time because I think most of us know where we are today. Uh, how different are we today than we were 30, 40 years ago? Uh, if the economy was, if you took the economy from four years ago and duplicated it, would we be where we are today in our region or would we be back where we were before, faced with some significant challenges. So 
from that, we're going to talk about, okay, what really is the vision? And last time we were here, we had the opportunity to go through, we talked a little bit about vision and what the communities, the people in the community would really like to see our region be. And to be honest, there is no difference from the Tipoli County to the very edge of Tazewell County. All through the seven area region, there is no difference. Everybody wants the same thing. So if we all want the same thing, how do we come together, pull together, and go after it? How do we get it? How do we start changing who and what we are so that we can get that vision? Some of those changes already started. I've seen some very positive things. We have some very bright spots. We still have some challenges. So we'll talk about, okay, what are the guiding principles? What are the values that we want our region to represent? And a lot of people have talked about, well, we have a, a very strong history and culture, right? Uh, we're proud of who we are and where we're from. We don't want to lose those things. We don't want to lose who we are in the process, right? So that's all part of the guiding principles and the values. And then we're going to talk about, okay, what can we do every single day? What is it we can get up individually and do day by day that will push us towards this vision? This could be our mission. And we'll go through that, what we did last time here, and we'll talk about some of that uh, as we get started. But the main thing that we're going to get into once we get to the large event is we're going to be talking about five bold steps. And we're going to develop some bold steps here today. And I've been developing these across that, the entire region. I've been having the participants to rank them as to value uh, that they would be to the region, the ones they feel like have the most value, have the most opportunity to be region-wide. Uh, you know, if we are able to do things region-wide, there are certainly better opportunities related to funding, right? Through ARC, through Go Virginia, through the Tobacco Commission, if we're able to do it regionally, we can get more financial support in actually accomplishing those bold steps. So we're going to look at that, and we're going to talk about where the groups that have come together feel like those bold steps, those bold opportunities are. And then from that, we're going to move on into a game plan. And we're going to say, okay, here's the top five of these um, bold steps. These are the ones that everybody feels like have great value. Who needs to do them? Who needs to be the resources? Uh, who is it that needs to take this task on? And what does that look like? And what kind of time frame do we think that we can reach those and accomplish those bold steps in. And I like to preface a lot of what I say with dream about 20 years, expect it to happen in five. Because the reality is at the rate of change, at the rate of innovation, the rate that things are moving, if we do not plan far enough ahead, then basically we're shooting at a target that's going to be gone, right? So we want to think far enough ahead uh, as we go through it. Um, so I'm going to jump to some of the things that we talked about. And each of you should have a copy of this in front of you. If you do not, please let me know. I'll make sure you have one. And this kind of gives you uh, the history of this process. This is the third of these meetings here in Russell County. Um, and it's interesting, we've had a lot of different people <laughs> represented. Uh, last time we were um, pleased to see a number of students that were here, which was great. Because hearing their vision tells us where our young people's minds are. And really what we're doing is we're planning for them, right? We're thinking about where are we going to be for them? It's not about us. It's not about what's going to happen with us. You know, our lives are, well, with the exception of one person in the room <laughs> who is very young, just, just really getting started. Our, you know, we're pretty well set, right? We are where we are. We're moving forward where we are. Uh, probably going to, going to, you know, be able to finish doing what we're doing. But what about a generation from now? Where are we going to be? How are we going to impact today what happens a generation from now. 
And if we're not thinking about it, look north. Look across the state line. And I, I don't mean to say this in a way that's going off on McDowell County. But we see our future. It's across that state line if we don't do something different than we've done in the past, right? Because we've done the same things over and over. <coughs> so we talked about some of our strengths. Uh, that we do see the growth in regional cooperation. We see some diversification, and that's, that is happening almost every day, which is fantastic. We see an entrepreneurial spirit, a uh, productive workforce. We see, you know, positive pre-college education. We see that the community is hungry. And we do see that in some announcements, recent announcements that have happened just here in Russell County, right? The bottle cap uh, announcement. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that bottle cap announcement. Um, I think it's great. I think it's fantastic. There's only one problem I have with it. <laughs> and it's not a negative towards Russell County. It's a, it's a perception that we have. Uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Opportunities we talked about was we have the opportunity to, have, to focus on positives, to have strategic outreach uh, around the positives, to leverage our workforce, uh, to focus on regionalism, regionalism to have aggressive large-scale entertainment opportunities. You know, we are changing. We do see tourism as a value, right? But is tourism the only thing? Do we really need to hang our hat just on tourism? Because what does tourism depend on? Disposable income, right? Disposable income. And when you don't have disposable income, what happens? The tourism industry shrinks. The other area of tourism, of the tourism industry that I think about is, you know, how many tourism-related jobs are really good-paying jobs? How many of them provide wages that are high enough for people to really live? If you're not the owner, if you're not the one who owns it, how many of them actually pay those, those type of wages? And just things to think about as we're talking through. Some of the problems we talked about was declining population. How many years has it been since we've seen an increase in population in Russell County and, and the surrounding region? And I'm not talking about little blips. I'm talking about you know, real change, right? It's been 30 years, right? Probably since the 70s, 80s. Am I wrong about that? Or I think that's about the time frame. Last time we had positive population growth. Well, what is that doing to our communities? They're dying. It, it is killing your communities, isn't it? So those are things that we need to be thinking about and talking about. Other problems, uh, mindsets need to change. How we think about ourselves. Uh, we talked a good bit last uh, time about you know, something that's come up at a lot of these is we don't like outside the outside world's perception of our region and of us as a people. But a lot of times we think about ourselves that same way. And we can't expect other people to see us differently unless we see ourselves differently, right? So another area we need to be thinking about as we go through this, this process. Other problems, declining good paying jobs, uh, threats, automation, population loss, less entrepreneurial spirit, which really seemed to be counter to one of the strengths <coughs> of entrepreneurial spirit, which you know, I've, I've tried to reconcile that in my mind. And um, maybe we have some very strong entrepreneurs, um, but we have less people utilizing that that talent, right? Mm -hmm. So we have less growth that's actually coming from our existing population. Political influence, uh, that was a big one. Do we, because we have less population, do we have less political influence at the state level? <laughs> Federal level? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So not only is the population decrease hurting our communities in the sense of our economy, it's impacting our communities in the sense of 
the political influence, the ability for us to create change on a larger scale outside of our region. Dependency. Dependency has come up on almost every single one of these, and um, it is a challenge. We have multi-generational dependency, right? Mailbox economy. Um, but, and I'm not saying this in a way to say that we don't appreciate all the help that we've gotten, because we do appreciate the help we've gotten. And the intention has all been for the purpose of helping us to move forward. But shouldn't our goal be to no longer qualify for the benefits associated with low to moderate income and poverty level households? Shouldn't our goal be to no longer qualify for those? Our goal should be to be something different, right? Do we really want to stay in that area where we can qualify for all these benefits? Or would we love to see Southwest Virginia be a donut hole in the ARC service region, right? I would love to see that. I would be thrilled if we could see Southwest Virginia as a donut hole. And then maybe that donut hole could actually spread out and move into other areas. So that was the threads, the spot matrix that we went through. We talked about the industry structure. And you'll notice there's a number of areas that aren't filled in here. Uh, a little less, uh, I won't say less important, but we've gone through this. We pretty much know what the technologies are, the suppliers. We know what's going on across the entirety of the region around the industry structure. But we wanted to talk, I wanted to talk about, OK, who are the players? What are the important things that are going on in Russell County and throughout the region? So we talked about energy is a big one, right? Coal and gas, um, that's a big one. Agriculture was a big one. We had health care. Um, we had education as being a huge one, right? We had retail. Uh, timber, government and social services, technology, coal industry, quarries, heavy construction, all of these are things that are happening in Russell County that are a part of our industry, our regional industry, right? So we talked about, okay, what are some new things that are happening? Things like downtown revitalization and what happened in, what's happened in St. Paul. Fantastic story. How do we see that bright spot and duplicate that bright spot across the region? Tourism, the tourism culture, the change uh, in our region around tourism. That was one of the new entrants that was talked about. Free higher education. I think this is one of the greatest things that has happened in our region. And I, hope, you know, and I think there are some other communities that are looking at and trying to uh, mimic this, but I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the Board of Supervisors said, every, if you live in Russell County and you want to go to college, you want to go to community college, you're not going to pay for it, right? That's the race program. That is correct. That's the race program that she just mentioned, and it is, uh, and I don't want to sidetrack here, but it encourages parents and it teaches people how to fill out the FASFA forms that's already there, and then we just supplement what right. the feds right. don't. But it, basically, it, it does create a situation where if you're in Russell County and you're a young person and you want to continue your, your education, whether it's the college path, whether it's the career uh, or, or trades path, if it's available through the community college system, you can go that route, right? So, very good thing. It we helps see to make sure that, that the students can see a path. That. Right. A lot of times, even though they might have been qualified through the past, but they weren't aware that they, it might fit them. Right. Yeah, it is a, it, it, to me, it's a huge, a huge thing. Because basically, Russell County Board of Supervisors said, if anything's left over, we're going to pick up. I know there's qualifications with that. There's requirements. And I, I, I love the fact Shit. that you've got to pass. <laughs> you've got to be able to do the work, and you've got to be willing to do the work. I love that. Uh, and it, it creates a responsibility at that young level. The other new entrance was some of the Vesita grant, uh, seed grant funding and some of the changes to Vesita's way they've done their programs, helping the entrepreneurs, very positive things. Some of the substitutes, uh, things that are happening 
that uh, are really substitutes for some of the other systems that may be in place. Uh, apprenticeships, internships, and on-the-job training. Uh, those are all uh, ways that people can get educated and, and uh, become or create a career for themselves without necessarily having to go to the college path or, or the training path. Uh, workforce credentialing. Alternative education. Um, I don't know uh, how many students in Russell County are homeschooled, but I would be willing to bet there's a pretty significant number. Uh, alternative education. Augmented and virtual reality. Uh, those were just a few. And you know, we didn't try to go into a lot of detail. We're really just trying to get a picture of where we are, right? Where we are today. Market context, uh, some of the things that we talked about were, you know, things like reshoring, mentoring, trends, uh, outdoor adventure, tourism, um, agriculture related businesses, uh, improving coal industry. That's had an impact, right? Uh, have companies gone back to supporting that coal industry? Absolutely they have. What's the impact going to be if that industry takes another downturn? And I think we know well enough, we see enough of history to know that it will go through another cycle at some point, right? So how do we help our businesses to future-proof themselves in that way? Um, we talked about uh, how technology is changing communication, how it's really hard to get through sometimes to Young people. Uh, I'm not trying to throw off on any young people, but you know, I've got two daughters that they like their devices, right? They love to communicate. It's just a different way of communicating. Uh, sometimes it's face to face, but most of the time it's through typing. So how do we <coughs> connect that to the value that is in the workplace? Uh, and then how do we help our employers understand the value to our young people? of that process for them. Things that we need to think about and talk about. Uh, we talked about political factors, the regional IDAs, and I'm really, really pleased to see uh, a regional IDA between Tazewell and Russell and Buchanan County, right? Uh, it's a fairly new thing. Hadn't been around for too many years. Um, and you know, Hopefully it will continue, those types of things will continue to grow. We have some regional IDAs in uh, other parts of, of the region as well. You know, um, one of the challenges in economic development is a lot of times we've, it's easy to get funding once you get, see a entity or a location get funding for something. You know that that funding entity will fund that, right? So. Well, why shouldn't we have one? We can get the funding to do that. Uh, it happened with technology parks. Uh, I know for a fact that it did because I was involved in that whole, that whole process. So we have how many technology parks from Lee to Tazewell County? And then how many of those technology parks do we have that are full? Now, if we had developed parks that were complementary, in collaboration with one another, could we have done a better job of filling the parks? And, you know, it's hard to think that way when we're used to competing next door. But our competition isn't next door anymore. It's the world. And we've got to think about, okay, how are we going to handle that competition of the world, <coughs> not our neighbor next door? But that was, those were some of the political factors we talked about. We talked about the economic uh, climate. Uh, support for mom and pop's businesses. Uh, right now, there's a, a good manufacturing climate. Manufacturing is, is booming. Uh, I can tell you that not just manufacturing, but across the board, there's over a thousand jobs open uh, in the region as a whole. When I say in the region as a whole, from really from uh, uh, Carroll County all the way to Lee County. Uh, I know that just last week, no, week before last, maybe been last week that they had a job fair down at uh, um, Bristol Motor Speedway and there was employers there representing over a thousand jobs. 
There's going to be a job fair, if it's not already occurred, at Virginia Highlands that represents over a thousand jobs. There's a lot of jobs open right now. The labor market is thin. If I had to put it in terms that I guess really quantifies it, do you, do you think we can say we're, we're pretty much fully employed? If you want a job, you can probably find one. I mean, a thousand jobs open, I can't remember a time in my life that that was the case in our region. I mean, do you all remember a time that that's been the case? So how do we deal with that? How do we deal with the fact that the competition for the labor is going up? There are things that we talked about, things that we, that we uh, talked about as part of the economic climate. Well, a lot of unknown opportunities. Talked about how quickly things were changing and the, the reality is, is it's really hard to plan in high school for what a kid's going to do in their career because the jobs that they'll fill probably don't even exist today, right? By the time they get through school, by the time they, if they go on to college or they get training, those jobs may not even exist. So it's happening, it's changing so quickly. So how do we make sure they have the skills that are necessary to fill those jobs? All of those were things that we that we talked about. Um, we talked about working really hard to get a diversified, truly diversified economy, an economy that can uh, sustain the region as a whole. Some of the inhibitors that we talked about, uh, old mindset, um, standards of learning. And I'm not throwing the standards or, or the teachers under the bus, but the reality is, is I've had a lot of teachers and school administrators in the rooms when we talked about this, and not one of them have said, we love and feel like the standards of learning have created, <coughs> has created the, the students that we needed to create. It hasn't. It hasn't worked. Started in the mid-90s. We're <coughs> two and a half decades since, and we're still doing the same thing. But we have bright spots. We got some really good bright spots. We have internationally competitive robotics teams in Dickinson County. We have <coughs> students in Wise County sending sat sending thin sats up in satellites and monitoring, you know, what's going on uh, in those in, in the, the satellites or through those satellite uh, connections. Bright spots. We have a team down in um, Lee County that was one of the first to compete in the Capture the Flag events. Um, and they competed not in our region because we didn't have them at the time. <coughs> they competed across the state. And that's, those are bright spots. How do we duplicate those? How do we get those moved into other places? And if we can't change the system, which is something I've heard, that it's very, very hard and slow to change the system, right? You know, how do you get it changed? I heard that it's beginning to be changed now, but it's a slow process. So how do we deal with that? When we know what the needs of our manufacturers and, and our businesses are, and they're telling us they're not being met because our education system is focused on something different than what they need. <clears throat> how do we find ways around it? How do we take those bright spots that are in some of the localities, duplicate them, and use those to help grow our education system. They should be in the room, right? We have a representative in the room. You were here last time. Were you encouraged by what you heard the kids say? Oh, definitely. I certainly was. I certainly was. And that's not the first time. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. These young people are smart, and they want more. Yes, they do. <clears throat> it's our responsibility to figure out how to give them that more, right? So let's figure out how to do that. Some of the customer needs we talked about was we needed a, to raise the uh, educational level of the citizens. Um, we needed to connect the educational system to our manufacturers. Uh, we needed higher paying jobs. Uh, communication and essential skills, skilled workforce, transportation infrastructure. We needed some things that we don't currently have. So the only thing I had against the bottle plant was the announcement that 
and, and I'm, it's not the Secretary of Commerce and Trade's fault, but he said one of the reasons they located here was for the low wage workforce. And that was like putting a knife through my heart. Because when was the last time we were prosperous? When was the last time we were truly prosperous? 70s, 80s? Why were we truly prosperous then? Less regulation. Less regulation, which led to? <clears throat> well, the regulation led A lot of to coal industry the, jobs, yeah. which were? High paying jobs. That also led to the to decline in the population. Yep. So, when we are selling ourselves at a value of 30% less than the average across the state, will we ever become anything other than low to moderate income? Will we ever come out of <clears throat> that poverty level? And the answer to that is no. I mean, you can draw a graph. You can put it on the board. You can say, okay, as wages go up, we're 30% below average wages. Low to moderate poverty level is going to go up, but we're still going to be below it. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can answer it now or later, but um, you said earlier, shouldn't the goal be to no longer qualify for the government household support? That's what you meant, I think. But what income does that require? Do you have that number? I don't have the number off the top of my head, no. What I was saying is, as a region, it would be great if, when we went to apply for ARC funding or for some of the DHCD funding, if they were able to say, I'm sorry, but you don't qualify because your household income is too high. I harp on this all the time in my own area. Right. A couple hours north. But, um, and I tell people all the time, please do not try to recruit 10 to $12 an hour jobs. That's not what we need. That is not what that area needs. It's probably not what this area needs. That doesn't get you to that income requirement <coughs> to, to avoid the need for the government support. To, to even, if it, even if it causes you not to be eligible for it, you still have the need you may not be eligible because you made a dollar too much. If, th if that doesn't change things, then it doesn't increase the revenue generation for a local area. But I am, I might as well go talk to that wall. Well, you know, yeah. I, I was, I worked for Tazewell County for 22 and a half years. I was involved in a, a lot of different areas within the county, but one of the things that I did was I did do a lot of support around economic development. And I look back at the way I did it. I, I thought, you know, hey, it's fantastic. It's a great selling tool. We can get this business here because we pay 30% less. I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. I really did. Because we could get that company to come to our area. But I wasn't thinking bigger picture. I wasn't thinking beyond what we are today. I was thinking about trying to sustain what we have today. And what we've got to figure out how to do is, as a region, we've got to figure out how to think about tomorrow. Live in tomorrow, not live in today. And it, as long as we continue to sell ourselves for that lower wage, we are never going to change the circumstances in our region. Um, I don't see, I, I, I do see, I do see some positive signs, some positive things happening. But if we could support our existing businesses and industries, existing companies we have, and they were able to pay a higher wage. What would happen over time? If we were able to support them to the degree that they, we were back where on <clears throat> the scale we were able to pay the wages that were paid in the 70s and 80s. You will retain and expand local businesses right. by giving them a higher quality Workforce. Right. And that's what you're going to attract and encourage in the people who will go to work there. Oh. 
And I've, I've had some of those exact discussions with some of the businesses that we work with, right? And they, they have a need. They need this type of employee. My question is, okay, if you had your best employee, absolute best, if you had all your employees were that good, what would it do to your business? And every single one of them, man, we could do so much more. We would, we would boom. It would be great. And the, and the what are you advertising for? What are you trying to get? What are you trying to attract? Are you trying to attract the absolute least employee you can get? Or are you trying to get the best? Which would you rather have? Would you rather attract employees from somebody else that are already good and great and coming into your business that could do the job already? Or would you rather get the next person off the street? And like I said, we're pretty much at full employment. So what you're doing is you're dealing with hard to serve, right? You're dealing with some folks that may have some challenges. And as long as you're advertising that wage, that's what you're going to get. So we, we have to learn to think differently. And that thinking differently comes hard because we're ingrained in, well, we're just piddling. We create a lot of things. Oh, we're just piddling. The value to what we do, we don't see it a lot of times. But the value is still there. It's still there. So and why is it worth less? In a say, matter of I'm days, sorry. Sorry. in a matter of days, we have several community colleges throughout the region, not to mention the high schools, several community colleges, the UVA wise, the the ones that are attending King College or whatever, and that I'm from the New River Valley. We have Virginia Tech in our back door there, or actually part of the New River Valley at Radford University, and well over 10,000 students. When you add UVA wise and all the, the local community colleges, we have thousands of students. They're going to walk out of there, they're going to throw that hat, and a lot of them are leaving. And we are doing, this is my opinion, we are doing nothing to talk them into state. When you offer low wages, they're like, why did I just spend all of that time and money? And energy and effort. The students that were here last time, I asked them a question. If you could make $70,000 here, or you could go to Roanoke or to Charlotte or to Atlanta or to somewhere close by, not too far away, and make $100,000 in here, which would you do? And there was one, one out of the ones that were here that had thought, well, it cost me less to live here. And all the rest, one. we're going to go someplace else to make more money. So if we want to keep our young people here, how do we do it? And no, we can't expect to give them that type of wage coming in, but the reality is, it's the perspective. They see, they coming out of school, they feel like they have a value that is equal, right? And over time, we've allowed that <coughs> equal value to erode away, where we don't always believe that we're equal. And as we don't believe we're equal, then how can we expect outside of our region, companies that are coming in, to look at us as equal? And, you know, so how do we deal with that? How do we start looking at changing that perspective, helping our companies to grow to the point where they can actually pay more? Because that's really what, what we're talking about. We're talking about figuring out how to raise wages. So what do companies have to do in order to do that? They have to make better margins. They have to make better profits, right? How can we help our companies to do that? Or they have to have less expense. How can we help our companies do that? So those are things that we need to think about as we go through this process. We need to be thinking about that. And we, we talked a lot about that as we went through. Did you want to? Yeah, what I want to say real quickly, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity yeah. to be, be in the military, work for several manufacturers, and now uh, see the side on the municipal side with the city government of Bristol, Virginia. So when you, when you really see all that, and this never dawned on me, for a long time, right? It's one of those things that you kind of have an epiphany one day. You know, it's like you see all the dots kind of connect. 
But you know, I worked for Berkshire Hathaway for a number of years, and you know Berkshire Hathaway is probably one of the most successful uh, companies in the entire world. And the way they do business, I had never seen before until I really got into that and see how they, they did business. So it was a very fresh, long-term approach. When you talk long-term, that's what we don't do. We don't think long-term. Well, they don't think like next quarter's stock price. They're thinking, what are we going to do in 10 years and 15 years to continue to reposition ourselves for growth? They're very long-term thinkers, right? Left Berkshire Hathaway, came back here, went to Bristol Compressors. Completely short-term thought process. Management was not thinking long-term, owned by private equity, thinking what are we going to do to reduce costs next month. Well, you saw what happened there. They're out of business. So it happens, it really depends on the leadership and the facilitation of where you're trying to take your company or your organization. You've got to be long-term thinkers. So if you've never read the book Good to Great, and, you know, I've read it two or three times. You need to read that book. And I don't just normally say read books, but I tell you what, that's really what you're trying to do. It, it doesn't matter if you're a company or if you're a government organization or if you're a region trying to grow economically. Good to great is conceptually what you're trying to do. So it challenges you to look at yourself and what you're good at, what you're bad at, which is exactly what you're doing here, and find your hedgehog. Find that internal hedgehog that you, once you get that engine going, it will not slow down. It will continue to generate itself. It'll generate these new companies and these new technologies and these new jobs and all the stuff you're talking about. But, you know, to do that, it's really hard. And it takes perseverance and it takes a lot of time with everybody around the table talking through all that of what we're good at, what we're great at. But, you know, it can be done. The companies that have really done that in the, in the organizations, they've transformed themselves. So what happened to the coal industry is just an example of what happened to the coal industry. But it's, it's the same dilemma. You know, they didn't think long term. They didn't say, we need to reinvent ourselves. We need to look at where else we can take a natural resource like coal and turn it into our hedgehog to where we really continue to generate economic growth, right? They were just relying on getting out of the ground and selling it. So risk compressors the same way. So it happens to a lot of places, right? So, so you got to read that book, and, and we got to figure out a way to, to live and do what that book is uh, asking you to do in, in, in our region, in the real world. And I think if we can do that somehow, we're, we're going to be really successful. But if we don't, we're going to continue to see, you know, what we've got in the past is, you know, what we've got in the past is going to be the same or same old. So. All right. And it all starts with conversation. All starts with <coughs> process. Understanding that where we are today is not where we want to be in five years. <coughs> Ten years. And what we've done in the past to this point hasn't really worked. And you know, lots of millions and millions and millions of dollars have been invested in projects. And I'm not against that. I think it's great. If it hadn't been invested, we would already be what we see across the state line. We would already be there if it hadn't been invested. So it has kept us from falling further behind, but it hasn't helped us to gain. So looking forward is really, you're exactly right. This is about thinking more long term. <coughs> it's not about what happens tomorrow. It's about what happens in this young man's life if he's able to stay in our region and wants to stay in our region whenever he gets to be my age and starts thinking about, okay, what do my kids want to do? That's what it's about. So that's what that's why we're here. Exactly. It's a question of what mm -hmm. low to moderate income is. Mm -hmm. How it's defined. Low income would be considered fifty percent or less mm -hmm. of what's called the average median income for that area, the AMI. Moderate is up to 80%. So if you're in the 51% to 80% of that average median income, that's right. typically considered moderate income. And so if you have enough people in a region that make less than 80%, then you qualify as you've got more low to moderate income folks. And we do. And we have for years. And it varies across the United States. Most of that's connected to. Uh, HUD's rules and community development block grant rules, but other institutions like Appalachian Regional Community <coughs> use the same case. Right. Use the same number, so it's exactly right. So low income is 50% or less, moderate is 51 to 80. Yeah, yes, exactly. Thank you. 
And that term again, AMI, is average median income. This will help me. I beat my head against the ball harder. Well, I can, I can tell you we had uh, the BEC, one of the BEC representatives at one of these meetings not too often long ago, and he was talking about um, the average wage across the state for a certain job. And it was being advertised in our region for $27 an hour. Pretty significant. You know. It was being advertised in our region across the region for $17 an hour. Prime example. You know, how do we... How do we set it up to change that? How do we set our, our future up to be different? And it's going to take active involvement, <coughs> active involvement from everyone. Okay, we talked a lot about technology factors, and there's a lot. Um, and that's something that I think that we really need to be thinking about, because the beauty of technology, the beauty of where we're at today, and the revolution that we're going through, and we are going through a revolution. Um, Four years ago, five years ago, four years ago, uh, there was a speaker at the Economic Development Forum at UVA Wise. He was a futurist, and he was talking about the future. Uh, and, and, and he commented, he made, well, this is the space revolution. This was before Elon Musk and everybody else got into, let's send all this stuff out into space. He knew, he saw, because he saw the changes that were happening. And other things that he that he recognized was at that time we were about uh, technology as far as growth was, it was growing about at, at a six times rate so about every, every year about six times greater capacity within technology he said within three years it's going to be exponential and he was dead on the money he was dead on the money and we are at exponential growth and when you know and understand and think about what exponential growth means around technology it changes your perspective on the world around you, because that world is changing very, very quickly. If there's ever been a time, if we can figure out how to come together, anticipate the changes that are coming around technology, and embrace those, if there's ever been a time for us to become whatever we want to be, it's now. We can be anything we want to be. We can have whatever wages we want to have. Do you think that the folks in Austin, Texas, at any point in time believed that they couldn't become the technology mecca that they are today? And the answer to that is no, they didn't. They knew they could. They knew they could. If I but, can interrupt a minute. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> um, the um, city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. they're a great story to tell about uh, the downturn in their coal industry. And of course things are still doing fairly well, I guess, in the Pennsylvania area. But in the downtown area of Pittsburgh, it was a coal town, a steel town, and it was just nasty, dirty. The things that go along with this industry, which is fine, it's part of it. But what they saw, they had a great vision there, and I don't know who did this because I haven't done that much research on it. But there was a university that came there, and they got into robotics. So they saw the future. And so as that progressed, a university came in and they did um, research, scientific research on this. Another university uh, located in the Pittsburgh area, and they were doing what you call put the, putting the skin on the robot. Right. And so they were working together in tandem in this big city that is now completely turned around. If you go to Pittsburgh today, it does not look the same. It is a beautiful city. They have taken care of it. They're attracting those folks to come back down and live in downtown. That's another thing that we're not doing, and we don't see that in coal country because we see it as, oh, well, that's the way it's always been. Our communities are becoming ghost towns because certainly people want to live where it is nice, where it's aesthetically pleasing, where you have opportunities. And I don't mean that you have all these uh, city things and shopping things. The younger, the younger generations don't even care if they walk into a mall. Malls are dead. Um, and so, you know, who saw that coming, right? Um, but anyway, you shop online, uh, you buy your produce and, and your foods online and just go through the drive-thru at the Walmart or the Food City and pick it up and they stick it in your trunk. Um, so that's what's going on today. If we don't get in tune with that, and we don't deliver our communities back to where they need to be. And that's something you haven't talked about, is a very robust 
uh, broadband system, <clears throat> which we do have here in Southwest Virginia. Right. And yes, I'm not going to take up your time, so that, I apologize. No, that, that, I appreciate it. appreciate all the input that, that you provide. It's important that we talk about I think about that's interesting. Reality. That kind of leads on, you know, the discussion of uh, drones, right? So, mm -hmm. so we've now seen the, the drone economy start to become yep. real, right? And so <coughs> Amazon now sells online. Well, you know what the next thing is going to be. You're going to get right. all your stuff delivered by drones. It's so, already happening. Yeah, it's already so, done. <laughs> so to be long-term and creative, you think of a region like ours, and one thing you can't change is the fact of where you're located and your geographical terrain. Well, we're very unique, and people are missing that. We are, we are centrally located. We are probably the most centrally located community you could put your pen on the map. If you draw a circle of a one-day drive, Mm -hmm. You know, we touch 48% of the U.S. population it's within eight hours. Seven well, hours that you can't say that for Kansas. You can't say that for the, the other regions, right? But you can say that for us. The infrastructure of transportation, interstates, rail, all that is in place because it was there centuries ago. Well, now all of a sudden drones come into play. Well, why do you think Navy pilots come and practice flying, flying, flying through the mountains? Why do you think they do that? They do that because it's the most challenging terrain for aerodynamics and airspace management, right? Through the mountains. Guess what we have? We have the mountains. So where would be the, the most opportune place to bring a drone company and a drone manufacturer to build their drones and test their drones? A place that's got that kind of terrain, the best infrastructure, so we could, you can teach those drones how to perfectly navigate through the mountains. You can run on the rail up above the airspace. You can run the interstates above the airspace along the ridgeline. Well, not, you know, we're not thinking that way. You know, we're not, we're not, I don't think we're challenging ourselves. That is the possibility, right? That's Absolutely. the absolute possibility. That so, will be right. a so, reality at some right. point somewhere. So then you do that. Imagine right. you got one company to agree to do that, and all of a sudden they really figured it out. Then all of a sudden now you're attracting Amazon because that's what they're going to use. You're attracting Walmart because that's what they're mm -hmm. going to use to deliver packages. And it has this magnetic effect, right, to, to draw these other companies. And... That's long-term visionary type thinking. That's what you got to kind of get yeah, out of the box. And what are we what are we missing here that we've got that nobody else has? And how do we? That's the hedgehog that's in that good to great. What do, what do you got that you're missing here? Your core competency that you can really leverage, and you got to figure out how to leverage it because you've not been thinking that way. Some other very bright spots, okay, um, related to the coal industry. Rare earth elements. Correct. How many people are familiar with those? Those mm -hmm. are incredibly important to all technology. And right now we buy most of them from uh, China, uh, right? Um, but we have projects going on. A lot of people don't realize we have, there's projects going on at the University of Kentucky, WVU, Virginia Tech. Um, all of them are looking at different ways to extract rare earth elements from acid mine drainage, coal ash, and coal industry byproducts or coal industry waste products, the overburden. All of it has that in it and it's being worked on in our region. A lot of people don't realize that. So, you know, that's another thing that we could focus on that I think has tremendous value that sometimes we just don't see. And we have companies in the region that are a part of a $20 million project that's funded by the Department of Energy to develop a process to extract those rare earth elements out of that overburden. I mean, that's, that's a significant deal. We also have a graphene research center. For those who aren't familiar with graphene, graphene is a, it's going to become a new material of choice down the line. Uh, it's already showing up in, in some unique places, tennis rackets, tennis shoes, <laughs> um, but it can do a lot of really, really cool stuff that a lot of other materials can't do. And if you combine it with other materials, it changes them. So the question that, that automatically comes to my mind is, okay, if those are things that are going to become realities, and they are, are we figuring out how to change the way we do things to meet them whenever they come into the markets? In other words, how is graphene going to impact welding and the combining of materials as we've seen in the past. You might not have to weld everything together. 
it may change things dramatically um, because it's an incredibly strong material. Uh, so we welding, have some bright spots. Or the how do we may have to change? How do we, as a region, see those and start planning and seeing that we have to do differently than we're doing? We're doing the same things year after year after year. We have to do differently than we're doing in order to get into and be prepared for the changes that are already here now that we're not prepared for. Drones, eventually. I mean, autonomous vehicles are going to be great. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be amazing. But that's going to be a short-lived market, right? Because what's right on its heels? Well, you know, real quick, uh, I, don't want, I don't want to get too much into the technical details. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, electric vehicles are all based around a, a mm -hmm. rare earth magnet. That's a exactly right. neobinium material which goes into those magnets that are rare earth. Well, everything in the whole marketplace is moving to electric vehicles, electric everything, and it's all based on that rare earth. Well, there's only one, there's only one place in the U.S. that actually can mine and doesn't anymore that rare earth. So if you get the rare earth figured out out of the coal mines, you have just changed the entire landscape of this region exactly because right. the only person in the world that has the quantity of supply, guess where it comes from? China. China owns 99% of the world's rare earth magnetic material. Well, that right there is a problem. When you see cars and aircraft, everything's going to go to rare earth magnets, and now we're going to be relying on them for that material. Well, they'll just shut you off in a heartbeat. But if you can figure out a way to get that out of the coal industry, but the challenge is how do we do that? You know, who, who's helping to facilitate those high-level technical discussions, right, from a university a, as a regional uh, effort to try to find these nuggets of gold, right, that we need to take down and pursue a little bit and I see what it is at the end of the rainbow, right? you got to have a process to do that, right? And I think that's kind of what we're missing. We don't really have a way of right. that's the uh, connection. doing that. Like a lot of companies would pay for their own R&D, right? Mm -hmm. They would pay for, they would, they would give a university a bunch of money to pay to research that. Well, maybe that's what we need to do as a region. We need to chip in and, and give a little R&D money to pay and look for, you know, get more than just what Virginia Tech's doing on what they've got. Give them more money from us and DOE to, to learn that faster. That or take existing companies we have and connect them in with them. <laughs> That's right. Get those companies connected in with that process That's so right. that they're first out of the gate when they're able to actually. I mean, who's going to build the processing plant that's going to separate it? Somebody's going to have to build that. Why not us? Why not here? We should be thinking that way. And that's, that's part of what we're trying to do. We're trying to see that there is change that's coming. I'm going to skip over the solution or product material curve. Uh, many of you have seen this. Um, basically, it just takes and you look at um, where products, solutions, or services fall within their maturity. Uh, and we have a lot that fall on the winning side. We do have some that are coming up that are better, that are positive, but are they long-term solutions to our, for our region economic, uh, economically? And I think that when you look at them, you know, existing technology businesses, yeah, probably. Um, we will go through economic downturns, so is outdoor recreation, I'm not throwing off on it, but is it a solution to our long-term economic in and of itself? And the answer to that, I think, is no. But it's important that we have it up here and we see it. So. it is, can I say something mm -hmm. there? <clears throat> it is a no, yes, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as um, the service industry that you talked about, the hospitality industry that goes along with tourism. But if you do not have these pieces in place that layers into this, that's, that's the whole, it's not one thing, it's not one industry, it is not one community, it's the whole thing that layers in there that gives those opportunities. Because where is a corporation going to come that wants to, to locate in a region because their employees need to be happy employees? So you must have a piece of that outdoor life. And we're seeing that that's more and more uh, a lucrative business because people want to be outdoors. We just heard a testimony from our dear friend over here. See the <laughs> Wanted see to the have outside. windows, yeah. see the outside. Absolutely. Water, <laughs> water and trees are what we're looking at. And I'm going to interject something that I want to say. To me, I think in Southwest Virginia, if we don't start, and again, I'm going back to communities, people need communities to live in. They need planned communities that function for them 
They need high-tech homes to live in so that they can live, work, and play where they, where they stay, in their central area. And so to me, the idea is, do I want 50,000 people with Amazon to um, come to live, plop themselves down in Russell County where I'm going to end up with VDOT traffic problems, I'm going to end up with a whole lot of issues because with those kind of success stories come the problems. So I'm trying to offset that. And you talk about a touristy town, you talk about the tourist of Gatlinburg. Let's go look at that. Pigeon Forge, what that has done, that industry has outgrown itself. It's already hanging out on the Interstate 81 now and 40. So do I want that? No. Does anybody in this room want that? I don't think so. Because the locals have to drive around the mountain because they don't drive down the main road anymore because you can't get to point A from point A to point B. So what I'm saying is, if we combine all the successes that we have right now, including our robust broadband, we've got folks who can work from home. If we make that possible for these people to work and play and live in this area and have a fabulous six-figure salary, we're already seeing that now. We're already seeing people who have offices in Fairfax, in Austin, Texas. They catch a plane, they go to work a day or two, but they do the rest of their time here at home where their children are playing softball, they're in our school systems, and we're integrated into that. That's what I see that another issue. You don't have to have a building that houses 800 workers Absolutely. anymore. I absolutely agree. And I think that the more that we as a region can grow organically, grow from within, uh, either grow new businesses or grow the businesses that we have, I think better off we're going to be long term uh, because we're not really depending on that, that outside. But I absolutely agree. I don't think anybody in any of the meetings I've been in wants to see us be Pigeon Forge or wants to see us be Washington, D.C. Crystal or, City. Or, or any other place <laughs> like that. Crystal City doesn't want Amazon. Want. And that was, that's, part of, that's part of what we talked about. Uh, as we went through, you know, and it's come up a number of times, journey vision. What we did was we had everybody go through this here last time, including the young people, and had them write down, okay, what, if they had a magic wand, and they could in five years, five years, make Russell County be anything they wanted it to be, what would that be? And you can see some of the responses. Diverse, diversified economy connected to all surrounding counties by mission and leadership that experiences an increase in population and new business development. It's pretty positive, right? An engaged community, state-of-the-art schools, trade-centered education, more innovation and entertaining things to do, robust business environment, single word prosperity. I think that's really what we would like to have, right? <clears throat> Vision-wise, we would like to have prosperity. An education system that values the skilled labor and gives teachers time to teach the real-life skills. I think that's kind of getting at the fact that teachers don't have time. It's not the teacher's fault that the education system is not working. The SOLs, I mean, what time do they have? What choices do they have? They have to teach to the test. So, a lot of problems there. We had embraced our culture and pride. And I think that's what you're talking about. We don't want to change our culture. We don't want to change the who we are. We want to change the what we are. Right? We want to be something different. We don't want to be that low to moderate income area that we've been for years. Benefits that truly help individuals be self-sufficient. Increase in good paying job opportunities. More local interaction, more small business growth, local health care, opportunity for student development. I mean, all of these were vision themes that everyone at the meeting last time divided. Can you think of others that we need to add to it? And this is where 
we move on into talking about, okay, what we're going to do today. Can you tell me additional journey vision themes? If you think of them, please write them down on the sticky note. And I will post them up on our map. While you're reading through and thinking about that, I'll talk a little bit about the guiding principles and values. This is the how we're going to be. Okay, the guiding principles and values. This is how we're going to be in order to accomplish this. Right? So we're going to be transparent. We're going to be inclusive. We're going to communicate openly. We're going to actively collaborate. We're going to insist on equality in education. We're going to actively lead. We're going to embrace change. We're going to be willing to take risk. Do these describe us today? Not enough. <laughs> we're all, if they we're, don't, we're awfully risk averse. How do we change it? If they don't describe us, how do we change it? Because can we truly get to this vision if we don't have values and principles that reflect that vision? And I didn't come up with the vision. I didn't come up with the guiding principles and values. Those were provided by the people who were sitting around the table. They see that as necessities in order for us to grow. So if you think of other guiding principles and values that we need to embrace, that we need to focus on and use as the way we will be to reach this vision, then write those down as well. And let me put them up on the map as well. Backing up one more step. What can I do? And this was the question, the mission. What can I get up and do every day differently than I'm doing today that's based on these guiding principles and values that's going to help lead to this vision? And I had a group in one of the other counties that said, well, what can we do? There's only 10 of us here in the room. <laughs> That's a good question. How many people do you know? How many people do you know? How many people do you know? How many Gerard's you know? Law 250, Joe Gerard, the man who wrote exactly How to right. Sell Anything to Anybody, called it Gerard's Law 250. How many people do you know? You know, at least 250. And that was before social media. So that number is probably a little low. So if you pass on the message of we can be different, every day, and the people you know are influenced by your message, and they begin to pass on that message of we can every day, will that change it has to. what we are doing? It and I think the answer to that is we know it will. We know it will. What about if we wake up every day and we're going to be open to all ideas? We're going to be open to ideas. We're going to hear them openly. We're not going to have preconceived bias to ideas that come out. And we pass that message on, and, that, and we influence the 250 that we know to act, accord, act the same way. Will that help us change our region? And I think we all know the answer to that is yes, it will. What about if we pass on the message we want to? I think the people in this room want to. Otherwise, I don't think you would be here. If you don't want something different than what we have today, then you're probably not going to be here. And I know this. I know this for a fact. Our young people that were in the room last time, our young people that were in the room in Dickinson County, our young people that were in the room in other counties, they want something different. And a lot of them say, we want something to do. Nope. It's been worked on, tourism and different things, outdoor activities. 
you know, it's, it's but that doesn't solve it in and of itself. I brought I, I brought up a discussion about six months ago, and I said, you know, when you look at all the things we have in the region, the schools, the colleges, the places to work, there's one thing we're kind of missing, and we've never had it. We've never had a place to where the brightest minds in this region can go, no matter who they are, whether they're eighth grade or ninth grade or eleventh grade. And if they've got an idea, <clears throat> we've got a place where they can go, and they can take that what if idea, and we help them walk the walk to mentor them of how to take that and turn it into something productive to where they could actually start a business, grow it, lead it, create a job. We don't have a what if space. You know, we don't have a place to where somebody that's thinking the way none of us in this room are thinking about an idea of some kind of software that could educate our kids right off the phone so they'd never have to get on a school bus. You know, there's people thinking that way, but we've never had a place to where people could come to say, hey, I got this idea. Well, if you had that place, and you have all these people in our region that want to do something different, you'd have a place where they could come and you could nurture that, you could help them. You know, it's, it's boundless. Just teach them, you know, how, how to ask questions and do the things they need to do and create that, that thing that we want that we don't have right now. But we just keep throwing up roadblocks, you know, and the reasons why you can't do things. So maybe we need to think about that as, okay, maybe that's a bold step. Maybe that's something that we could do as a region that could add value. Right? Are you calling that a co-working space? No, I, I think I think what I'm hearing is it's more like an innovation space. It's a space yeah, where it's very it's a very long term busy yes. innovation space. So it yes, is, it, it's kind of like a it's kind of like I think of it like a wheel, and it's the spoke. It's the very center of the wheel. It's got mm -hmm. lots of spokes. Like you know, maybe somebody wants to create a business, so you got to give them that spoke. Mm -hmm. Maybe they want to mm -hmm. get some kind of unique software education. You know, so there's a lot of things, but mm -hmm. it's a place where they can go and and they can take that idea wherever it needs to go. But you let them. Go walk that bridge. You let them build that path. Whatever yes, it is. but they have a they have a place in San Antonio, Texas called Geekdom, mm -hmm. and um, that there's a lot of innovative uh, companies because a lot of the folks in Silicon here go again Silicon Valley folks um, because they're just the brightest and the best minds ever. But they they like collaboration and they like um, <clears throat> they like the part that they bounce off of each other, and so they all meet in this public space. And they have access to the internet and they have their tools. And so they're doing their own business or running their own thing and creating that and growing that business. But then they've got a partner that they meet up with across the table, so to speak. And they come together and they have built another company. So that's, um, it's a fun thing. And I toured the spot and it's absolutely stunning it's absolutely what they're amazing. doing. Uh, but the, those are the minds, and that's what I see. And we don't even have, heck, we don't even have something like that around here. People no, go, what is that? Any, anywhere near. They don't even know what that is. There's one of those in Dallas, there's one of those in San Francisco. So you go to these places, and you'd be surprised when you walk in there, you go, it's the wow factor. It's like, wow. No wonder this is uh, Silicon Valley. No wonder they're doing yeah. the things they're doing. So we don't, we don't have that. That's foreign to us. Let me ask a question. Are those individuals who are doing that actually any brighter than the people that live here? No. no. And the no. answer that I know the answer because I've seen no. the businesses, I've seen the creativity. It's amazing. But what we've done is we've been really good at reacting to problems. A problem comes up, we can solve it. Right? A coal miner runs into a problem underground. He can't go get a bolt. He has to figure out how to fix it without one. Right? We solve problems. We're really good at solving problems. The problem we have is the problems generally have to already exist. We have a hard time seeing what new problems would be, anticipating problems. So if we can figure out, and, and that's what I'm seeing is, okay, let's anticipate some problems. I'll give you an example. Anticipating opportunities. That's exactly, it's not really so, a problem. Problems are opportunities as far as... Your, your kids here in this area go to Governor's School in Abington, is that correct? I would suggest that maybe, um, and I don't know who that would be in this area, um, should have somebody from each locality on a Governor's School board for that Governor's School. I would suggest that you begin to try to influence that to go in that direction because if you and I heard you say I'm a school board member in Pulaski County so my ear, my antenna goes up when I think 
kids don't go to school and like, oh my gosh, the school system will be funded over that. Uh, so that weakens the opportunities for the others in the school system. Um, maybe approach the governor's school and it'll take more than one conversation to see if you can guide and direct that, that to that direction. It's a wonderful idea. I think I'd heard of that. That or do something totally different. Yeah. You just don't I, want to I, be, I agree. You I think want to you want to, you want to try to pull as many people in as you possibly can. I absolutely agree with that. The University of Virginia College at Wise is doing that now. Um, that is going to be located in the Oxbow Center in St. Paul. And uh, their Board of Visitors inherited uh, the large building down there. And there's going to be uh, the beginnings of a co-working space in that uh, section there. And they've started what's called the NEST. And they've placed that in the area of WISE. And that's college students. And, and Tommy over here, he might can tell us more about that yeah, than I can. It's actually open to the community too. So uh, there's students and communities and businesses that can go there and work together. And I know a friend of mine actually is starting up a business and they're walking through the process and who to talk to and things like that. So it's really cool. Something like, like, something like that is going on here. So we have some bright spots, right? Yeah. Yes. Bright spots. How do we duplicate those bright spots across the region? And those are some of the things we need to think about as we move towards the bold steps. Those are fun things. Right. Those are things that's very attractive to the new generation mm -hmm. and not our way of thinking. And I toured another one in Richmond, Virginia, which is up the street from the Omni, and I can't, the name of it escapes me. But um, they, they want to locate in historic buildings. They want to locate in the downtown areas because that's the hub. They want to be in an action-packed place. <clears throat> and so they come in, and um, I, I'm going to Google that and find the name before we leave here today. But uh, they started in this four-story building, and they built it out. Uh, very modern, lots of windows, um, co-working space, common spaces. They had already, before the six months was up, they had 85% occupancy. And these are tech companies that are doing marvelous things, making lots of money. All right. And, you know, I, I, I think that what's happening at the Oxbow Center is, I, mean, I think it's great. Uh, I think it's a, a place for things to start. Because, in my opinion, we need to have five, six, seven of those across the entire region. Yes. They need to be tied to our existing businesses or ex existing businesses when they have an idea and they don't know where to go with it. They can come in and access that intellectual talent, that intellectual resource that they need to help them go to the next step with that. Um, I think there's so many opportunities around that type. In fact, there was a, a grant that was put together, uh, never got really submitted, but it was put together to actually help create that type of situation across the entirety of the region, uh, from Tazewell all the way to Lee County. Um, but that's something that we, we all have to figure out, how do we come together and make something like that happen? And it was based somewhat on what you had talked about at the manufacturing technology, uh, not the manufacturing technology, the, the um, Go Virginia manufacturing meeting that we had. Remember when you talked about the Spiral Innovation Center? Yep. Exactly what you're talking walk about in, there. It's got a spiral yes. case. You walk in, it's all yep. color coded. It's open, yep. and you, you see you see all so the boundless possibilities. A lot of it's based on that. But and then you walk up the great staircase place to start and get things done. Is yeah. what's happening at St. Paul because it's already beginning to happen there. Well, let's think about that as we move forward towards. We're the just States. not used to seeing it that way. See, that's our right. problem. We we've, we've got blinders on. We have to think differently. We have to learn and train ourselves to think differently. So, does anybody disagree with the vision? statements that you see there, with what you've read in those vision statements. Does anybody disagree with those? No, I, I just wrote down internal economic uh, social engine. That's where, really what we're after as a vision. I didn't know how to, because a lot of those things, what we're really after is creating this, you know, this engine that, that we want to create that. So absolutely, absolutely. I wrote that down. But Can you put it on a sticky note? And I'll oh, put yeah, it on the yeah. map. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. I don't see it spelled out specifically, but I think probably a, a strong sense of community is important. Please. 
I'm just trying to, that, that's the only way I can capture it, is if people will write it down. I can't. I can write it down, but I can't write quickly enough. Anybody see anything that they would disagree with with the guiding principles and values? One of the problems that, that I see, whenever I want to do anything, particularly with the uh, government or agencies or whatever, mm -hmm. I ask them, and I say, well, that's not been done before, so you can't do it. <laughs> uh, and then you go to them and ask, well, how do we get this done? And it, look, we do, we're doing the same thing we've done, and we're successful because we're here. So you know, my problem has always been, how do you break that? That's a good question, and that's something that we need to think about. Are there bold steps that we as a region can take that will help us to get over the challenge that we have of the old mindset? That's never been done before, or we can't do that. Is there a bold step we could take that, or you know, is there a group or an organization or something that we can pull together to help us? You know, one thing as a, as a mm -hmm. people, as a culture, we, we're, we're bad at handing the baton over, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't take the wisdom of where we are and give it to the next group that's going to do something with that wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. And so here we are with the wisdom because we've lived through this now. We need to hand that baton over to these young folks that want it different, and they they're motivated to make it different. They've got the vision and teach them what we've learned and say, take this and run with it and, we'll, and take the reins off and let them run. So the, the people he's talking about, we're, we're stuck in that. Right. That's the way it's always been done because that's the way we've lived. We don't want to change it. Well, this is not our world anymore. This is the new young people's world. Give them the baton and give them the means to make it happen. <clears throat> Just open up the bounds. That is a guiding principle. Be yeah. willing to pass on the baton. I didn't even know that, but I was just like... So, if you could write that down, be willing to pass on the, <laughs> pass the baton. That is a guiding principle, right? Okay. Does anybody see anything they disagree with around the mission? What you can do every day as an individual? Anybody see anything we need to add? Because I'm getting ready to move on. We're going to start cruising now. We've got an hour left. And we're going to talk about our competitive advantage. And then we're going to talk about our five bold steps. Okay. Okay. Moving on. It says on your sheet, competitive advantage. It says on the wall, value proposition. Basically the same thing. What is it about our region? What is it about Russell County? What is it about Southwest Virginia that's special, that's different, that makes it possible for us to be something different? Okay? So when you start thinking about, okay, who are our target customers? Who is it that we really want to create or do something differently for? And I think it's our citizens, right? It's our youth. It's our businesses. We want them to benefit from us doing something different. It's the community as a whole. It's even the way our infrastructure is set up and the way we do business. We want that to benefit, right? So those are basically our customers. And people that are outside the area. We people people, that want to come people here. outside that want to come here. The tourists that want to come in. Uh, businesses that our businesses connect to outside or businesses that our students connect to outside. Those are all parts of our target customers. So what is it that's special about us, about this region, that adds value to all of those groups? Well, I mentioned one earlier. I mean, you can't put a pin on the map 
and be more centrally located to the U.S. population okay. than where we are. So let's we start writing those. That. That's let's, where we are. let's start writing those down. Write down, if you don't mind, take your sticky note. Write down what it is that you absolutely love about our region that sets us apart and makes us different. What is it that you love about our region that sets us apart and makes us different? And it doesn't just have to be one, it can be multiple. As many as you want to put down. I don't know to read that. I'm going to have to have some help. Read them off to me. Okay. And so we have two of the oldest rivers in the world oldest in our back yeah. here. here. Uh, we have more diversified vegetation here than any place okay. else in the world, except the Amazon River Basin. And our geology uh, and rock formations are exceptional. Okay, okay. gotcha. gotcha. Okay. I'm going to make some notes on this so I can remember what that is. That goes back to science and the study and the whole study of the Clutch River Valley and what's going to happen. In the future, for that, that's going to bring in more universities, more professors, more studying. Um, I see, I see NASA here. That's been kind of my vision: research and development. Mm -hmm. Hey, robots that they're talking about. What would put those robots to work in the mines? <laughs> okay. Well, like to me, I've been yeah, three of you. Three of you. Yeah. 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 I just, I just don't see, I just don't see the jobs of the future as being like every working 500 more people. Well, you know, the underground mines, when you think space exploration and NASA, I don't know if you, listen, if you watch the NASA channel much, you know, this whole vision of NASA now is getting, you know, third-party contractors to do what NASA wants to do, which is go, you know, put a, a, a lunar base on that, that, that then they can launch from there to go to Mars and, you know, keep going out. And, and so they need places to where they can do that R&D and set up mocks. So underground type uh, terrain like we've got where you got empty underground mines is a place to do research where humans would be without light, without things for an extended period of time. I mean, there's just so many things we got here that would support NASA's mission. And this administration has just come out and said we're, we're going to space. We'll create a new space uh, department of defense, or at least that's what they space want to do. Space revolution. Huh? Space revolution. I mean, go figure. It's real. It's real. It's happening. It's happening today. So. Okay. We've got a lot of things up here. Now, as I go through this, 
as I ask questions, don't get offended. Okay? Just be patient. Because I'm going to ask some questions. It's going to be kind of maybe a little bit hard. We have a great culture and we're inviting. Is there any place else in the U.S. that's that way? Everybody. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sure are. Every community okay. sees itself as the best place to live. Well, I wrote that one and I can tell you. No, I, I cover. I, I, it's okay. I cover. No, you don't, it, it's okay. You <laughs> it's okay. Just, just, just wait. Just wait. Just <laughs> wait. Beautiful geography. We live in a beautiful area. Is there other places in the U.S. that's beautiful? Absolutely. 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 Okay, good internet, broadband for business purposes. Again, are there other places in the U.S. that are that way? Now, can I tell you a story quickly? You, you can, but if it relates to broadband... It does relate to broadband. Then just give me a minute. Okay. You can tell me this. Just remember, keep the story in your, in your I mind. I hope I can. And, and <laughs> we'll go back to it, okay? It's empty up there. We have two of the oldest rivers in the world. We have biodiversity unlike any other place in the U.S. Correct. So that is very unique to us, right? Uh, and we have geology that is very unique uh, in, in the nation, right? So those are pretty unique to our area, right? So those are things that we be able to set us apart. Trees, grass, diverse biosystem. Okay, beautiful location, mountains, change of seasons. Do other places have changes in seasons? Some places only have one season. Some places do. <laughs> but there are other places in the U.S. that have changes yeah. of seasons, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Central location. Well, we are centrally located. There's not a lot of places in the U.S., that, but there are other places, even close by, right, that would be fairly centrally located uh, to population. Fresh H2O, rivers and lakes. You know, again, quality of life. Uh, how many places in the U.S. have this great quality of life that we have here? There are some, right? There are some. <laughs> Technical skills, again. Uh, farmers. Uh, miners. Miners and agriculture. Can-do people. It's people that can fix stuff. Can people, people that can, they can fix, that's right. And is there people like ours in other places? Maybe some. I don't, in my opinion, to the degree that we have, I think the answer to that is no. But I'm biased. And I recognize that bias. I don't think that there's anybody. I mean, I look at the people who left here and wound up going up into the Rust Belt and down into North Carolina to work, and none of them had any problem finding jobs, right? They just sucked them up because, well, they were good at what they did. I'm a little biased. I think that we're probably the best at that can do. Central location, uh, we touch 48% of the U.S. population again. Um, the mountains provide outdoor activities and our colleges that we have um, to offer. Those other places have those, right? Transportation infrastructure, we have some pretty good effort, uh, transportation infrastructure around I-81, I-26, I-77, mm -hmm. rail, airport, 19, and 460. Loyalty of people. I think that's one that you know, some places say, yeah, we have, we have very low people. Workforce is willingness to work long hours when given adequate wages. A lot of places, I think, would say they have that. Underground opportunities, mines and space. Well, not a lot of places have those specifically. So let me ask you, what is truly our value proposition or our competitive advantage? What is it about us that's unique? And this is just the way I want you to see it. This is the way I see it. It's all of these things. It's the fact that we have all of these things here at one time. And how many places in the U.S. can say they have all of these things? And I would be willing to bet that gets down to maybe a handful, maybe two handfuls of communities across the entire U.S., right? Have all of those things at one time. So there's not that many of us out there. So we do have something special to offer. But who are we offering it to? Right? Are we focusing on 
what's going on outside, or are we focusing on what's going on inside? Um, and like I said, I've been, I was involved in economic development for many years. And I look back. I missed one. We have the best place to kill a cell phone signal. Yes, we do have some good <laughs> places like to one. kill <laughs> cell phone signals. Is this another one? Yeah, Rich soil and food and farming, uh, world hunger. Yeah. I like that one. We can solve problems around that. But all of these things together is what makes us unique. It makes us special. And we are special. We have a special people here. Um, I was talking about economic development, and I did do a lot uh, in and around economic development for a number of years. And I can tell you 90, per 90 plus percent of our efforts were trying to get those companies outside to come in. We needed those companies to come here to give us jobs. And one of the biggest things that I hear from companies today that I visit in our region, and I visit it a lot, is, man, we would like to have some of the same benefits that the companies coming in from outside have. And light bulbs start going off in my head. You know? What if? What if our region, and I just want you to ponder this, it's probably the craziest idea that could ever be thrown out there, right? But what if our region said, we are not going to focus on attracting businesses from outside into our area anymore. We're going to spend 90% of our effort, dollars, and, and influence to grow the businesses we have. Amen, brother. What if we did that? What would happen at the state, Virginia Economic Development Partnership? Cool. What would happen? Put a lot of people that work, <laughs> What would happen? I mean, we would build as sustainable business community and climate that would attract outside businesses to come here and outside people to come here and people who left to repopulate and come back. Mm -hmm. well, I, I think that would be the end result. I think it would be, it would send a shockwave, right? It would send a huge shockwave, not only to in our state, but outside of our state. How many communities have said we're not, we're going to do that? We're not really, we love companies from outside. If they want to come here, we have an open door, but, you know, if you want to come here, you're going to be treated just like the other companies that are already here. That's it. You're not going to get anything special. I think that would be wonderful. Of course, it would keep me from coming out this way as much as I'm sure. <laughs> Since I, because I think it would be more supportive. Is that a different way of thinking from what we're used to? Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Let me ask another question. How much effort do you think places like the Silicon Valley and Austin, Texas, and some of these other booming and growing economies, how much effort do you think they have to put into attracting businesses to come there? They haven't, Why? Had, they haven't Why? had to do that for 30 years. Why? They probably in the beginning, they said, hey, we're open for business. Why? Why don't they have to? Because, because it feeds on itself. That's exactly right. You have the organic growth. That organic growth, the companies from outside see the value that you place on the companies that are there. They want right? to be that. And they want to be a part of that. And then it creates really a collaboration and a synergy that helps that community to grow organically. I've said that at many of these functions. Is it something that could realistically be done? That's fine in your head, John. That's exactly what you're describing. So thinking about, okay, what if we did that? How much effort do you think we could get DEDP to put into modifying programs to help us with that if we get it as a region? I mean, honestly, I think they would listen to you. They would. If it was a regional, regional if it was a regional collaboration. If it was, I think they if it was from Lee County to yes. Tazewell County and everybody in between saying, yes, we want a piece of that, I think they would listen. If you have those fresh thinkers, you have if you stack it up with the stale old bodies, you're not going to get anywhere with that. 
So how do you <laughs> make sure? Sure. How do you make sure? And is there bold well, steps? Just, is there bold steps that we could put into place in our region that would help make sure that we have fresh thinkers pursuing those types of things? Okay. So understanding that we do have something of value to offer. And we've talked a little bit about, do we want to offer that to somebody outside, or would we rather offer that to the people that are already here? I think we ought to reward the people that stuck it out and saved. Right. We've got some very strong businesses across our region, very strong, that have that innovative way of thinking. They just need a little more help. And that's true, but they need to be able to diversify. That's exactly Because right. that's, that's exactly the problem right. is you can take what's been going on here for a long time, but you can diversify that and, and create something else. I'm a business person. I've been diversifying for the last 25 years. So to keep myself fresh and in business. Right. You can't always make the same widget that you've made for the past 20 years. Is that right there? This, is, this is the solution, right? Our businesses do need to diversify. They've been in the coal industry, and a lot of the products are old and they're stale. They've been the same or they've been similar for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. But we do have a lot of companies that are doing this. We have companies that are in new markets selling similar products, okay? Moving from the coal industry into other mining related, like Trona, for example, or uh, Hard Rock, or Precious Metals, okay? Moving into new markets. We have companies that are doing things that are totally different. They're saying, you know, this isn't working, so we're going to go the route of Department of Defense. Because you know, there's a lot of money being poured into the DOD. I mean, how many? Well, well there's nobody else pours the kind of money into projects, spends the kind of money that we spend on defense. Nobody. And there's no companies that spend that kind of money either. So why can't we have a piece of that? And it's more now than it ever has been, right? They're doing builds now that they've never done before, and they need supply chain. That's why we have a program. Uh, it's a Virginia uh, rural DOD supply chain program where we're actually connecting businesses in the southwest Virginia region with either prime contractors or with the Department of Defense or federal government directly to get them those opportunities. In order to do that, and you're right, businesses have to be willing to change themselves. That's exactly and continue right. to obsolete themselves and recreate who they are so they can go into these other markets. And that's the hardest thing for people to do. So, it's absolutely the hardest thing for them to do. And 99% of them are unwilling to do it. They think the old way is the right way. They can continue to do what they're doing. And then, they, then time's not on their side. And then they wake up and it's too late. And the market has already left them. And then before you know it, they're out of business. That's right. Happens what, so many times. What percentage of the cell phone market does Apple hold? The smartphone market share? 20 Market share. Yeah, not much. 25. What percentage of the profits? It's, I think it's 15 or 20 percent of the market share, but they own about 60 percent of the market. It's actually, profit. It's, it's about 25 percent of the market share, 75 percent of the profits yeah, in the awesome. market. Yeah. Why? Right. It's because they're doing exactly what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. Every they time this thing themselves. gets up to here, they're bringing a new one of these things yeah. out so that it can move up the chain, so that mm -hmm. they can actually mm -hmm. continually have that renewal. Mm -hmm. This is something that we're actually working with a number of businesses on. And, you know, uh, they're, called, and they're in a unique market to where they understand that that technology is obsolete in about 24 months. And 24 they have months. to do it or they're gone. Other companies that aren't, you know, technology-based like that, like, you know, if you're in the trucking industry, they don't see that. They don't see that they could be reinvented that quickly by like somebody else and then be out of business. But it happens. It just takes longer for it to occur. That's exactly right. <laughs> and it's going to happen a lot quicker than we realize. In the trucking industry, for example, we're being preached at. There's 50,000 too few truck drivers in the, in the nation, right? 50,000. They need 50,000 truck drivers. But what is on the cusp of happening? Oh, self-driven uh, battery-powered trucks. That's exactly right. So what are we going to do? Every vehicle is going to be battery-powered self -driven. All of those truck drivers suddenly have to find new things to do. And it's going to be a process. It's going to be 
you're going to go to pilots, and then you're going to go to to mm -hmm. you know groups of trucks driving together with one pilot, and then you'll go to you know no pilot at all within the, the, the trucks. But so what are we going to do with those what you're missing, truck drivers? What you're missing right. is you're missing the technology end of it. Of somebody has got to be so driving you're exactly that you're right. truck somebody's or that be, caravan or whatever. Somebody's got to be building the parts exactly. that go on the truck. So and who is thinking about exactly the so. existing trucks that are out there? And how to convert them into autonomous trucks? Right. Who's thinking about well, the that? whole autonomous? That, that's a great point she made there. Because mm -hmm. who who's working on this? Google, mm -hmm. right? Google. Mm -hmm. Who's got it? Google Maps. We drive ourselves around automatically. Google Maps. What's happening with this thing? You're talking to the satellite, right? Mm -hmm. Automatically. So back to my statement of, which it was kind of sarcastic, but we get the best area to lose the cell phone signal. Yeah. Well, who do you think needs to be here doing the R&D to figure out how you're going to do autonomous vehicles? It's in St. Paul. You drive over there, I agree. and as soon as you get into that community, it's like it's gone, right? And it's like, well, you can't have that with an autonomous-driven vehicle that's talking to a satellite. You have got to overcome that dilemma, or you'll be driving off the road and wrecking every vehicle out there. So They already are, the trucks, <laughs> the trucks <laughs> right, delivering to Dominion, <laughs> Virginia City Hybrid Center are getting okay. lost. Okay, I'm, I'm glad that we've talked about and we're thinking about that, that future, okay? Because we're going to move on into the bold steps. And what I want you to do is I want you to think about what can we do over the next three years, five years, what can we do that will help us cement this value proposition, that will help us to... I'll use my clicker here. That will help us to reach this vision. What is it that can actually help us to change this? And I don't have the answer. And there's no one answer. And you mentioned it earlier. There's a lot of things have to come together. And as I went through this process, the light bulb went off in my head that we could have Amazon come in here and it would be great, but it would be an utter failure because we don't have the system growing. The system has to grow. The community has to grow. We're not so ready. how do we, <clears throat> we are not ready. figure out how? Well, you know, that's a part of our problem. Community. We think, of, well, let's go get Amazon, or let's go get whoever and bring them here. What, what, we're th what we need to be thinking is how do we leverage that value proposition and let them come to us, yes. right? Yes. Don't try to drag them there to you because that doesn't work. Just create that unique environment, create and they will come. That they'll want to and be. then let's nurture that along. That's right. where I go back to building communities where people can live at home, play, spend their money, have their drones fly their product in, whatever, because that's the wave of the future. It is George Jetson, whether you yes, want to believe it, it or absolutely. not. Absolutely. And his boy, Elroy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's George Jetson. And sometimes we don't see that. We don't see that. So how can we, what bold steps can we take that will help us to get there? That's the one thing we've talked about over and over again is that we have not done a good job of marketing who we are and what we have and what we have to offer. And all these things that you put up on that value proposition with all the things that we have, who else knows that? We do. Well, we know it. We do. But, but we've, not done a good, we've not done a good job at all of putting that out there to the rest of the world yeah. to see all that we have to offer. And right. by so is there a project that could be done that could help that? Is there a project that could be done that could help our existing businesses create a culture or environment that would make other businesses want to come in? Is there a project that could be done that could help our educational system to make changes and take the bright spots and spread them throughout? Is there a project that could be done? And what I'm saying is, are these bold steps that we need to, to capture so that we can include them with the others? And I'm asking for them. I'm asking for you guys to think about, is there a bold step? And if there is, write it down. Say, if we did this, and don't think about the things that say we can't. Don't think about those folks that, says, that say it's never been done so we can't do it. Don't think about that. Think about if there was a clear slate and anything could be done, what would you do that would help us to get to the vision, that would help us 
to leverage our value proposition for our competitive advantage that would help us have these values throughout our communities and be the, the place that we want to be. So what is it that we could do? Write some moves down. I'll quit talking now. Well, I think to get the juices caught on, I think when you said we don't market ourselves, this comment over here, that, that's actually spot on. <clears throat> so when I was at Berkshire Hathaway, one thing I learned in the boardroom the very first time we was in there, the, the CEO said, people, people in organizations that don't know how to market themselves, they show up at trade shows, and they show up at places like that. He goes, you've got to, you've got to know who you are. And you've got, to, you've got to study the market, and you've got to try to leverage who you are to create the best reason for them to come to you. So it's all about how you market yourself. So you're right, we've done a terrible job at marketing this region. And I said, if we'd have brought 100 people to come in here and said, you know, okay, you've got two minutes to sell this region to X, Y, and Z company or individual, you know, we wouldn't do a very good job at it because we've not thought about how to market ourselves to really be a wow you know, they don't, you know, they don't understand how good we are and what we got to leverage. And that's definitely what we've got to work on. That's one of the bold steps, in my opinion. And in Bristol, you know, me and the city manager, we've been sitting down trying to create our own wow video. I said, you got, you got 120 seconds. When you bring in somebody and you say, the reason you need to be in, in Bristol, Virginia, you better capture their attention in about 120 seconds because otherwise you've lost them. So you got to have this wow video that shows all those things we got up on our value proposition, and then you yep. go, and then the last thing is, that's the reason you need to talk to us, right? And then you got their attention, yep. right? And the last thing I want to say, has anybody ever, and it's got to go viral, whatever you do with the marketing, it's got to it's go, it's got to take what we're saying viral, right? So that if we put that out there on social media, it would go to... 10 zillion people without us doing anything. It's that good. That's the way we got to think. And I wanted to ask this group, have you ever seen that little video that was on um, YouTube? Well, it's been a while back, but it's, it's, it's this video starts, and, and you don't see anything but a black screen. And then these two eyes come in, and you hear this drum playing. And, and it's got this really cool beat to it, but you don't know what it is. But you can't stop watching that video. It's got you entrained in what is this. All you see is these two eyes. And then the, and then the, the screen opens up. And all of a sudden you're like, well, now what is that? You still can't tell, but you know it's something. Well, it ends up being, and it keeps it open up, and the, and the beat gets better. Well, it's this gorilla playing the drums. And then it stops, and he goes, get out of, uh, get out of chocolate. you got to have it. It was like a commercial for chocolate. <laughs> and I was like, that thing went viral that day and touched like four million people in the first hour just because of the way it was put together. It was so intense, you, could, you couldn't stop watching it. And that's what I'm talking about, you know, when you got, you got a little bit of time to catch somebody. And that's got to be you one of our goals here. I, I think you have to market. You have to flip the coin and mark it in a positive way what you don't have. You may look at it from the other way. Um, a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, I, when I was at Mountain Empire Community College for a conference, it was, I think, my last time out this direction. And I live in the Dublin area, off of the interstate. I cover down to Danville, Pennsylvania County, up to Allegheny, and everything west. So I'm driving all around. But I live not too far off the interstate. So that's my... I hear it. I'm a few miles off, but I hear it. You can still hear the hum. We've been, gotten used to it. But on that day that I was here at Mountain Empire, and I came out the day before, so I had about 24 hours of not being near an interstate. But I didn't pay attention to it while I was here. About the time I got back to Abington, got on the interstate, and all of that stress came back, I thought, oh my gosh. Now I know what part of the issue is. Just And that in itself is a higher quality of life. It's not ever marketed here. And you think, well, all of this end of the state is, is 
the same. It's not the same. We have, pro I don't know how many people you have here in this county or the surrounding. Some of our counties are about the same as some of the NRV counties. But we have a, we have a lot of traffic with that interstate that creates sometimes a lot of congestion for us and issues that we have to deal with. That's a positive for your area. The lower stress is a higher quality of life. For so take those what you don't have and look at it on the other side. Make it the positive. You know. And I want to move out here for that reason. <laughs> but I got to find the job that pays. <laughs> Sorry, but I need bold steps. <coughs> hey, I don't know if it's written right, but you know. that's, that's good. You I gotta know. think about this. Think about it. That's okay. We've got, we got time. <laughs> We've got plenty of time. <coughs> you bring lunch in? You bring lunch in? Are you gonna keep yes. us? That's what I was going to tell you guys. Lunch is coming. They, they have set food up already, and it's set up. If you guys want one at a time, go ahead and make you a plate, and Sam can continue. Because we will finish up, set up right outside part. the door. So yeah, go ahead and get your food and then be eating while we're doing this. I'd like to thank you more about the chef for the funny and the wallet. To respond to that type of need because all these trucks aren't going to just disappear and go away. Somebody's going to do it. Somebody's going to come up with that solution. Who here can start thinking about that? Who here can start looking at solving that type of problem? And I know that we can, I mean, we have the ability to do it here. Uh, I could pull some companies together, but everybody is so busy and they're dealing with the problems of today, it's so hard for them to think about that future. The problem is if we don't think about that future, the problems of today aren't going to matter, because today is not going to be here. It's going to go away. Uh, next economic fluctuation that comes. How many companies in our region are going to be impacted to the degree that they have to lay off people? And I think that we know, we've been through this before, we know this exercise. So how do we help them position themselves so they don't have to? That's hard, you know. That's, it is. That's, that's, that's kind of, I, I kind of live that world, you know. So mm -hmm. you create this very new product that's cutting edge, that absolutely nothing can compete with it. It's very unique. And then you go present it to the OEMs or somebody's got to then take that product and put it into their product before you can actually sell it. Everybody's so risk averse. Yeah. It's like, you know, you spend hours and days and weeks and months, and, and, and if they don't see, if they can't see, Right, and be willing to take that risk, right? It dies an early death, right? And that's one of the hardest things to get over is that. The frustrating thing is that eventually it will come back around. There'll be something. It will. Oh, right? somebody will do it. Eventually, it's somebody, somebody will, will do it. take the risk. risk. But these big corporations, somebody's really big, has got a lot of lawyers and they've had product liability claims and get sued every time some, something Very fails, risk right? They're all risk averse. So anything new is just hard to move forward. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So the challenge isn't an easy one. I don't think that it's a complex one. Okay? No. I don't think that it's something that's beyond our ability to figure out. But I do think that it is very, very, very hard. And it's going to be very hard for us as a region to change. Because people in general don't like to change. They don't embrace it. And we have systems that are in place that don't facilitate change. So thinking about these bold steps, okay? I'm going to read them off. Um, the central entity, uh, what if, uh, idea zone, innovation bridge that leads to action. So basically a place that's a what if zone. Right. Where you have right. people create ideas and create the what ifs and then that right. zone. A place. Yes. Is the or multiple places or, or multiple places you know, right. something that actually provides opportunities to take ideas and to vet them and turn them into something. Market marketing uh, driven action. 
uh, wow market video value, uh, viral, rather. Okay, is that something that could be a, a, a project? There's some sort of marketing effort going on in the region. I believe the Tobacco Commission is funding it. I'm not sure exactly what it's about. Yeah, the Commission's got a grant out there. They haven't put all the rules on it, but there's probably just come up now to maybe issue this fall. But yeah, to basically put money forward for it, for a person or entity to do the regional right. economic development to put together how we're gonna market ourselves, what's the plan, how we you know how we're gonna bring right. talk to folks, and um, so tobacco is going to fund that. I wonder if they would. Myself, <laughs> we will eventually get around, get around to that. I think marketing ourselves to outside, to the outside world, is is one thing. I think that's great, but I think the best possible marketing tool we could have would be success internally. That organic growth, you know, you know what I'm saying. So just thinking in those terms, I wonder if the Tobacco Commission would be willing to help focus or fund more projects internally. Smaller projects internally. I think they would. As long as you so, got the as long as you got the plan and the description and how you right. want to use it to intrinsically grow companies within and you know it kinda you can see it. I think they'd do it. So yeah, the more put a regional I wonder if that's gonna take into account the cultural, the community, the tourism based pieces you know what I'm saying? It, it is a whole package. I mean, well, we could go out. Right, and if it's done right, it would. Yeah. No. Right. And why would right. you reinvent the wheel and spend money where you've already spent lots and lots of money on, <clears throat> like, part of Appalachian Tourism Authority, Blue Ridge Tourism Authority, Southwest Cultural Heritage um, Commission, which is the Hartwood Building that's marketing right. the overarching. Why? Why would you do that? I can't figure that out. But okay. Okay. Something to think you about. Mean, why would they spend? Why would the tobacco companies be willing to spend more money when yeah. they throw money at those kind of places? Yeah. Right. They don't know what they're doing. Mr. Well, <laughs> 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 Mr. Campbell. we we've got a television show. We got over a million viewers. We've been in business more than thirty years. We have a YouTube channel that goes all over North America. We're starting a podcast that goes worldwide. I get more information, and more people want to know what we're doing, and give us information from Kentucky than Wise County does. And most of these people we try to work with, oh, we're doing it, we've got a place on you know, some kind of internet thing, but nobody knows to go to it. But there's self-imposed, that you know, they're the super ones in, the, in their own community or their own mind, but they don't get out to the rest of the world as where they need to be, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so, so what I'm hearing is basically that we're siloed that were siloed in between our organizations. Uh, and that's come up at other discussions, is that you know there's a lot of silos where even like service providers, they're in their silos, they know what they do, but they don't really understand or see what's going on outside. And sometimes there's duplication of efforts that are going on across those silos, where if we were had a better system of communication, that we could actually tear down some of those silos and, and have collaboration rather than individual projects. And I guess that's you know that's kind of what I'm hearing you say as well is that you have these organizations already doing this and now they're looking at doing something that's different and it's going to be its own kind of thing. You know why why can't we collaborate and make it all one big effort? I guess is, is, is well, that what kind of needs what to happen. It's become so dysfunctional, right? Because it's like all these little entities that popped up over time because one had a good idea, they went after some money and that popped up, and then you know that didn't really come to fruition and do anything substantive, and so then another one pops up. And, you know, so it turned into this conglomeration of all this stuff, and yeah, that's just what's happened, right? I mean, that's the only way we can explain it. So Tobacco Commission has helped throw that money out there, and, they, and you can list them on your fingers, all this thing that they gave money to, it didn't really turn into anything. So, when that whole Go Virginia thing came up, I said, you guys better be careful, because it's going to be another flavor of the day, if you're not careful, right? Same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Because you got to overcome this whole 
we as a region have to be com we have to be committed 110 percent to this whole idea of we want to be one team, we want to be one region, and we want to go out in the world and kick tail and tell everybody who we are. Until we get that agreement, until we start acting like that, then the rest of it's not going to work, right? So you got to first kind of do your work internally and make sure we're all on the same page and we are definitely going the same direction. And then you can put an entity together that would take that group and it would, it would turn into something. Okay, well, let me ask you a question. Is there a bold step that would help facilitate that process you just described? Mm, yeah. You could call it a number of things. I don't know what you call it, but you know, creating a you know one one community uh, one community leader out of all the. We're aiding. We can't fight. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Go ahead. But no, I, I want to capture that because yeah. So the, it's like uh, creating a. The concept has come up in other ones, and you know, capturing it is is important. All right, I'm just going to be All right, one of the problems that I say all these entities that you're talking about are supposed to be doing showcasing whatever we have. They aren't working together. And one of the reasons is, is my entity doesn't want to take money from my money sack and help somebody else get started. So we just won't start, we just won't work with them at all. We keep doing what we're keeping doing because we got money coming in for what we're doing and most people don't know what we're doing. I mean, just look so, at it. That happens all the time. Is it a me versus a we? It's me versus pre preservation of whatever it is I'm doing. Is it a, Particularly it, it, if I'm or, getting some kind of government well, agency to help I'm saying, fund is it. There, is our region struggling with a lot of areas saying, I want for mine first, and if there's anything left, it's okay for the, the rest, rather than looking at it as we all need to work together to, to raise the ship of, of everyone. Because if, if we stick in this me versus we, if we stick in the me, then all that we're talking about winds up being right. useless. It, and that's exactly the way it works today. Everybody's got their own IDA. Everybody goes after their own funding. They try to take care of themselves. That's the sort of, But it's not any fault of each right. of those municipalities. That's it's the way it's, it's a, always been done. That's it's just, a product, it's just the it's way a product it's always been done. How that it? got created, right? right. So That's the exactly state right. set up all these individual IDAs. They set up these yes. municipal yep. governments. So Bristol, and it's how it's how it's supported right. from the state. So the Bristol's state autonomous from Washington County. Washington County's autonomous from Smith County. Smith, you know, and so they all get their act. So therefore, they all went and fought for their own money and their right. own their own value stream money, right? So then they went out and they did their own thing. And so now you wake up, you know, decades later, and that's what you've built, and that's the culture. Now, you, now you're talking about, well, let's, talking do, about let's, let's do a 180, right? Now let's, exactly now let's do right. a about face and unwind all that and create in a different way. Let's create a team uh -huh. to do this differently. Let's revenue share. That's exactly right. And we're starting to see some of that. I mean, we so are, we're starting uh, to see. So, that, so there's some bright spots right. that are there. That's People right. are recognizing that we need to work together. Well, I mean, I met with Washington County multiple times. I said, guys, it doesn't matter if you go if you go recruit a company and it plops down in Washington County. Bristol's going to benefit from that. Mm -hmm. we got right. people living in Bristol, Virginia and Smith County that drive to your location in Washington County, and you got just the opposite of that. So all these arbitrary lines need to just go away. So, if a big company came into Russell County, do you think there's not people from Washington County and Bristol that would get employed there? Of course they would. They are. I mean, I mean they would live and, and put a house here, but that's not the way we think as, mm -hmm. as municipal governments. They just, they have their own little sandbox, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, and it's, that's not the way to think. Because Bristol, Virginia doesn't have any land. But let's say our economic development person stumbled across a company that needs 40 acres and is willing to hire 600 people. Well, we don't have it. So we say no, and they go away. Or we say, you know what? We need to show you some stuff in Russell County because they have 40 acres. They got 400 acres, right? And and that's the way we got to think because then they would plop down, pay me in Russell County, and you get you might only get 10 people to live in Bristol, but hey, 10 is better than zero. And but Russell they're going to shop in Bristol. But they're going to shop in Bristol, so they're going to go across the bounds of the line. Nobody cares about those lines, but, but we don't act that way as governments. Think, thinking about exactly what you're saying there, okay? 
And we are seeing some bright spots where we are seeing that there are some governments that are coming together and saying hey, we need to do some regional IDAs and we need to be thinking about revenue sharing. Do we think the processes that we have in place today are going to be adequate in transforming our region quickly enough to deal with that future that's coming? No, no way. Okay. No way. That being the case, what should be done to help create that change. Because we can throw up our hands and say it's hopeless, but I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that. I believe that we can do whatever we need to do, but we all have to be willing to work towards that. What types of old steps could potentially be done to do that? And you put, you have me put up a, a sticky note, know, Team Southwest Virginia. Create Team Southwest Create Virginia. Team Southwest Virginia. Mm -hmm. So an entity that says, go one team, and we're gonna do this in a team, it's not we, it's or it's not me, it's we, it's us, and we're, that's what we're going to do. So we're going to revenue share, we're going to okay. you know, leverage all our assets together, speak in one voice, and and help each other out along the way. So, I mean, that's okay. a simple term, okay. but that's what... And it, I was just trying to get to, okay, is there... Because there has been some discussion about how we go about doing that. Because government does move slow. That's just the reality of government. It moves slow. It's hard... To, to change things within that process. So we need to figure out how to do it outside the process. Same thing with the education. We need to figure out how to spread these bright spots outside of that structured SOL environment, right? Because we can't afford to wait on the time that it's going to take to change it. So, okay. Um, Reinvent uh, communities and small towns. Must be high tech, 5G. So do we think that, that there's a project around becoming uh, or, or having high uh, 5G here? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, we did have dark fiber in the ground for a long time. That was great if it had been lit, right? Mm -hmm. We still have great dark fiber, and it's starting to get lit now, which is great. Um, but, you know, the problem with that is, you know, I keep telling people, you know, you you got to be two steps ahead of technology, because five five G is five G is uh, a year in the rearview mirror. That's exactly you're exactly and, right. And fiber is that close to being obsolete. You're exactly you're, you're absolutely right. That's true. Because what happens when the, the satellite, satellite constellation gets in place, mm -hmm. yes. and you no longer need to be tied mm -hmm. to a mm -hmm. piece of fiber, and that's going to become a reality. I mean, it just is. We know it is. Um, okay. Develop a region-wide mentoring system where we train advocates for the economic and workforce strengths of Southwest Virginia. Partnership between public and private education, higher education, cha and chambers of commerce, uh, city, county, town government, social organizations, and other nonprofit agencies. An advocate for Southwest Virginia. Similar to Forward Wise County, but longer training. Okay. Well, it definitely sounds like a project almost in and of itself. One of the things right. that we talked about was marketing a little bit, and we touched on that. Mm -hmm. And um, I've had the opportunity to travel around in, in the Commonwealth, and uh, sometimes when I'm in different places, a lot of my, I guess my dialect or my slang will catch people's ears. But nonetheless, they'll say, where are you from? Where, what part, they think I'm from Texas or whatever. But I'll say, um, I was saying far southwest Virginia, and I had one person say, oh, Beckley. <laughs> and I was like, no, the Commonwealth, the place that we're standing is hooked to the western part of Virginia. So we've all decided in my little neck of the woods that we think that we should say, when you want to know where I'm from, I'm from Virginia's great southwest. I'm not Southwest Virginia because that sounds like I'm Southern West Virginia, and people do not know where to stick me. Um, so that's we've changed a slogan, and I, and you're right, it has to organically come up. And so those of us that have talked about this, they get it, and so we've started our new slogan. I like that. I'll use it. That's Thank funny. you. I, I mean, I'll let me tell you something real quick. At Fox, you know, Chris Steinwart at Fox News, he does all the political analysts for elections. He was up in Washington, D.C., giving a talk that we were at, and he's from West Virginia. And he's a great speaker, really funny. And he got done, he started asking questions. All these people had serious questions. He got around to me, and I go, 
Well, my question, Chris, is real simple. It is amazing to me <laughs> that somebody has mastered the English language like you being from West Virginia. <laughs> and he goes, and just exactly where are you from, sir, he said. And I go, well, I'm from Southwest Virginia. And he said, oh, Grundy. <laughs> <laughs> Just about, I mean, I was That's laughing funny. so hard, my sides were hurting. I said, Only oh, he would know where Grundy right. is, right? Yeah. I thought that was hilarious. Grundy or Hurley's cool. Yeah. TV, UTEP, YouTube, podcast, etc. I think that ties into marketing, uh, mar marketing uh, driven. Uh, create a marketing video, yeah, get viral. So that's, that has the potential to be a project. Create Technology Valley. You know. uh, I think that's a you know a fantastic thing. We need to be thinking and dreaming forward. Uh, whatever we want to do, let's do it. Let's just do whatever it is that we want to do. Leverage our birthplace uh, of country music. And I think that's certainly could be done through a marketing effort. So that kind of ties in with the marketing, right? So I'm going to move all the marketing pieces kind of over in one place because we're going to do a last thing I'm going to ask you to do before you leave. Um, okay. Better college community relationships, this would create emotional connections. In other words, what I'm reading here is that we leverage the higher education institutions that we have. University-driven uh, economic development is very, very powerful. So figuring out how to better leverage that throughout the region could be a, a, a bold step. And I, absolutely. I think that I think there's efforts going on there. And obviously we have somebody from UVA Wise here that's a, what's your title again? A community builder. Community builder. Right? Mm -hmm. So they're, they're trying to do exactly that. How are our communities reacting to that? And how do we help our communities to react more strongly in a more positive way? So uh, I think that definitely could be you know, part of a, a project or a project in and of itself. Uh, change the Southwest Virginia Economic Development Forum into a two-day event with uh, more brainstorming sessions uh, with economic develop and workforce developers. Develop the ridge lines, uh, highline or site satellites, uh, repeaters, Wi-Fi. So I said develop the ridge lines. So one thing we got the mountain and the ridge lines. Mm -hmm. You get into like a lot of the space technology and all this. Uh, the ridge lines is high line of sight, and you can see like mm -hmm. for miles and miles. And we've never thought about developing the ridge line or putting some of it's environmentally friendly to where we leverage technology off the ridge lines. Right? Other than radio towers, I mean, we do it, but they look like crap. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Right. So we got that's that's unique to our area. We could we could take a bold step and start getting a lot of interest in technology focused in these communication satellite comms. Sure could. Because Absolutely. we got a lot of sight. And I have gonna have like yeah, the the, the links that are gonna be necessary as that initially develops. Those ridge lines are gonna become very very important. Yes. Uh, existing cell sites are going to become very, very important to link the satellites to one another to create that mesh as they begin to build because it's not all going to happen at one time. It's going to take some, some time and process. Yes, sir. Yeah, and I got two other things to say. Is, uh, Doc Boggs from Norton, he played the blues on his banjo. He's the one that influenced the Rolling Stones band, right. which is worldwide known. And also, Ralph Stanley from the next mountain over here. He play in downtown uh, Lebanon, Norton, Coburn, get 10 or 12 people, a dozen or so. The same week he'd go to Japan and fill the stadiums. Right. What are we doing wrong? Why can't we get those people over here? Right. That's like developing the music heritage and the yep. country yeah. music birthplace. We're not, do, we're not doing that. We could do that. Hilton's is the only place I know that's got any little small place that's doing a little bit of that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think there's opportunity here. Yeah. There, there, yeah. there, yeah. there has been some discussion in the other round tables that you know, we need to figure out how to, to leverage the music industry that we have here and create opportunities, mm -hmm. venues, entertainment opportunities, mm -hmm. that type of thing here with those. So the last thing that uh, I think that's, I think I've read over all of them. 
Last thing I'm going to ask you to do is each of you have three votes. Okay? Each of you have three votes. And what I'd like for you to do is come up here and pick the ones that you think have the most likelihood of being able to be regional projects. Again, don't take into account the concept of this is the way we've always done it, we can't. Okay? Take into the account that yes, okay, all of a sudden everybody's on board and we're we're going to do something. Which ones do you think have the biggest impact long term and which ones are most likely to be able to be done? So you have three votes. If you could make a mark on the sticky note uh, that yeah, this is what I want. Now I've grouped these are vertical, I've grouped those together, because that's really part of a, a marketing effort. Uh, all of that would need to be included in a, an effective marketing effort. So I've grouped those together. So before you leave today, if you could rank that and vote for that, then that would be great. Now, the next question is, are there some of these that are more specific to Russell County, or that Russell County would like to work on specifically within their the confines of their region? Or are there some of these that in order for it to be successful, you're going to have to have some underlying support by doing projects in the localities? If there are, uh, and I've offered this to all the communities, if there's interest, then we'll take the ones that apply local and we'll develop game plans around them. We'll talk about, okay, who needs to be involved? You know, uh, who is it that really needs to take a lead in this? Uh, who is it that needs to be parts of that team and who needs to, to help make the decisions around it? Um, what is What are the specific tasks in order to get it done? What is the, the critical path to get it done? And what are the time frames you want to put with those? Because that's what we're going to do with the ones that rank the highest here, but we're going to do it in the big event. Okay? And then after you determine, okay, this is the process, this is the game plan, what are the things that are going to tell you we're successful? Uh, what, what is it that's going to be successes? And then what are challenges that are going to come up that may get in the way? Um, so I'm willing to come and do that here, uh, just like I'm willing to, to go to all the other communities that we've done this in to continue the conversation. Uh, I think continuing the conversation is important. I don't want this process that all these communities have gone through through these 30 plus uh, meetings that we've had to just be a report. Because at the end of the day, if we don't do anything with it, we're going to waste it all of our time, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to have wasted my time nor yours. So how do we make sure that we keep moving the projects, <coughs> keep moving the ideas forward? Again, you know, um, it's been mentioned that the companies that have been successful are those that are constantly looking for what's next. That's what this process does. It tells you where you are to start with, and then it's looking for what's next. And then based on the value that you can bring, what can you do next, okay? So it doesn't need to stop. It really needs to start over. And we need to go through, and, and once we do some of these projects or start some of these projects, we need to say, okay, now what are some of our strengths? And hopefully these projects can be listed in those strengths. What are some of our opportunities? Maybe we'll see some spin-off opportunities from those projects. You know, what are the problems that we're still struggling with? What are the threats that are still there? You know, how do we incorporate that into our process moving forward? So I'm offering basically to say, you know, I'll come back. I'll continue the conversation if that's what everybody wants to do. But I'm also completely content if everybody says, you know, hey, this was good, but, you know, we'll just wait and we'll see what happens with the big one. And uh, then we'll go from there. So I'll leave anybody that doesn't already have my business card, a business card. And if you want to talk about it, <laughs> then we'll talk about it. And uh, uh, We'll see if Thank we can you. keep things moving forward. Yeah, I'll put that up there. So this okay. one is basically um, a, a sticker that says, <coughs> facilitate how we're going to create our next best big great thing. Because that's what we really need as a region, I think. No one is helping to facilitate that discussion like, he's, like you're doing here. right? To, so if you've never been, I put Eureka Ranch up there. And you need to get online and look at Eureka Ranch. 
It's a place you go to learn how to do product development. And big companies go there, Lincoln Electric, um, Kimberly Clark, uh, Dow Corporation, all these big companies. Well, it's a place you go and they teach you how to think outside the box, how to get completely out of your comfort zone, and they make you do all these exercises to, to figure out who you are, what do you want to do, is that a good idea or not? Why don't I think about opposites? Now let's data mine this a little bit. Let's look at let's look at what's out there like this. What's out there different like this? And so this whole week is takes you from what you thought you wanted to be to something down here. She said, "That's it. That's my nugget of gold, right?" And it's it's a very facilitated process, right? You got to have somebody that knows how to run it. If we had our own Eureka Ranch in this region that we could bring all the <coughs> cities and municipalities together and some of our business leaders. And that's what they would do in Eureka. That's what they would do in that ranch. We call it whatever we want to, Appalachia Ranch or whatever, right? We would walk out of there in two weeks, and you'd be absolutely flabbergasted of what you would come out of there with. You would come out of there with three or four things that were off the chart great, and you, everybody was committed to it, and you were going to go do it. And you'd never, ever thought of it before walking into that, walking in those front doors. It was the furthest thing from your mind. So that whole Eureka Ranch is very interesting at in how they take you and make you think about things differently to get you out of the box. Under whose auspices is that? They have a facility. Oh, who? Uh, who runs? Who runs? Who runs? Who, I don't remember the who. Who's behind Eureka Ranch? I don't know who funds that. Um, it, I think it was set up originally as a private uh, entity. You know, somebody that was just interested in innovation and private investment and. You know, had some expertise and kind of created his own little deal, but I don't really know who finds it. I mean, but it's a, it's re, you ought to go to it if you have a chance. It's really, it's really good. I'll tell you here in just a second. It's up in Ohio. Yep. That's what's website now. It's a business management um, consulting entity in and of itself is what it is. Worked with companies like Coca-Cola, Lowe's, P&G, uh, Sears. Sears hasn't worked with them recently. <laughs> Sears obviously didn't send the right people to that training. <laughs> uh, or they didn't pay attention. That or they didn't pay attention. <laughs> they didn't pay attention. They were on the golf course. Like, who, yeah. was, who, who was more set up for success to be the next Amazon than Sears based on all the catalogs? So, and how they uh, that along with day. your what? thought on a Eureka oh, Ranch catalogs. and bringing, more set up the bringing groups of people in for that. Catalogs are just people love that work with the catalog. The only place that groups in Virginia can go, basically, and house everybody under the same roof for a conference is the homestead. Mm -hmm. And some of the conferences, like the Sherm Conference, the State Sherm Conference, actually has outgrown that one, so people have to go down to the little places uh, I mean, <laughs> down the road a few miles. But that is something that would be used. I know we can go to Greenbrier, but that's in another uh, area. We don't have boundaries, do we? Hmm? That's right. No, there is no state no, county lines. Well, state county right. lines, no lines, right? There is, well, it depends on the funding. Yeah, I, I agree. I understand because I like the state. I found to, out yeah. on the way here, I couldn't have a state car out of the state. I'm like, no idea. Y'all should have told me that before with the Gate City or Richland. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, they don't. They don't. Yeah, no, but. Here in Richmond. <laughs> but you're right. I think Homestead would be a good place to, to do that because it's you don't have distractions. No, there. I'm not saying take your Rick and Ranch there. So Somebody one day has like to that. build another build one. Build something of like those. that. Gotcha. <clears throat> well, let me ask you a question. Was today useful? Was it worthwhile? Um, do you think it's going to add value in the long run? What could I have done better in this process? And that's a lot of questions at one time, but the last one's the only one that matters. <laughs> if you think of something that I could do better, a way that I could do it better, write it down on a sticky note. You don't have to tell me. You can if you want to. I'm okay with it. 
Um, but you can write it down on a sticky note and, and just leave it on the table and I'll find it. But, uh, well, I kind of jumped in halfway. You know, this is my first time because I right. don't know about this. But the, who, who organized this and, and why was this brought well, together? Well, this was part of a series we've done as a part of the Heart Project. Okay. okay. So the Center of Excellence actually does the um, setting up the event right. They take care of, they've taken care of the food mm -hmm. uh, and organizing all of that. The Workforce Development Board uh, worked on making sure the space was available, uh, got it uh, pinned down and actually connected with you know, folks in the room to say, you know, hey, please come to this event. Uh, and then uh, we are, as a part of the, the Heart Project Gen Edge, uh, we've done the facilitation. So it's kind of been a partnership. Um, as a part of the community development concept that we're, that we're pursuing, um, I, I can continue to do these types of facilitations in, in, throughout the entire, re entire region for the communities that want them. So, you know, I can continue this process and can't always guarantee food, but I can guarantee if we can find a location we can get people together that we certainly can get through this type of facilitated process to, to try to help us uh, find that path forward. Uh, and it's going to take all of us to kind of doing it together. Um, I would say, I mean, then the, based on that comment, I'd say the only thing you're missing probably is once we leave here today, you, you got to bring you got to bring this group and another invited group together to where we can present what we talked about today to where we do the next step. We create our five bold steps and we all take okay. serious action to do it. If we don't do that, it will just fall on the wayside. Okay. Not what's going to happen on the twentieth, mm -hmm. the big event that we're going to have. It's going to be held here. That's what you're going to do there. We're actually going to take the bold steps from all of the the facilitated sessions we've done across the entire region. Uh -huh. And we're going to take, they've been ranked, right? So okay. they're, they're, as you put your mark up there, you're basically ranking them. We're going to go through those bold steps, and we're going to talk about the ones that are ranked the highest, as far as the most doable. Yep. And that's actually going to be facilitated somewhat partially by a panel of business leaders. Okay, I've already got two committed, uh, and we're going to have the business leaders that are going to say, you know, hey, have you thought about this? And is that what's going to happen on the 20th? It's going to happen on the 20th. Okay. And we'll, what we'll do is we'll go through, we'll spend about 15, 20 minutes talking about where we, where all of our similarities are. Because the reality is, is I've seen very, very few differences. From so who's going to get invited to that meeting? Everybody that's been a part of any of these, as well as everybody else that we have contact with through SVM, through the Workforce Development Board, and, and through Gen Edge. That's everybody true. that we know is going to be invited. So all the all the yes, city governments and IPA folks, the economic developers, I mean, those folks will be invited too? What's that? They'll be they'll invited. Developers yes, they'll be invited. They, 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 a lot of them have been, invi been invited. Well, we got lucky. Weeks. We had two. We had Ernie McFadden from the IDA and we had Lou Wallace from the Board of Supervisors. So, That's two big thumbs yeah, up. Yeah, for yeah, city of Bristol. City of Bristol. <laughs> so <laughs> what we focused on for huh? this particular process was Lee to Taswell and that basically workforce development area one yeah. because it's kind of different than the other area. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually what we would like to do is take the results from this and say okay based on these results what applies over along the 81 quarter and there's going to be a lot of application uh, and so we'll get the communities over there together and start pulling them in and say okay how we all as a region create this hole, this donut hole that no longer qualifies because we've been able to take our communities and, and raise the bar to the point where. Now, it is a work in progress, so uh, I've kind of changed delivery methods and processes as I've gone through and saw what worked and what didn't work. For example, when I was just asking people to tell me bold steps, I may get three, right? But when I ask people to write them down and start insisting on them writing them down, then I get a lot more. <laughs> so, you know, I've had to change methods to, to get what we need to get. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Before you leave. One, two, three. One, we have three votes, and it's not, you don't have to do one, two, three. It can be just three. So number one is a higher. Votes.
writing the number. No, I just, have just one, one, one. Just, just one, one, one. Just select the ones that you want to I select. You can put mark. all three of them on one. Oh, you can put, a check mark. You know, one on each okay. one, or you can, you know, however you want to do it. You have three votes. 